Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this Dental Board of California meeting. I am uh, Dr. Alan Felsenfeld, and I am proud to be the president of this board. Today is Thursday, August 25, 2022, and the board meeting is being held in person with an additional public participation through, uh, through WebEx. For all of those who wish to participate online, please log in to the WebEx site provided on the posted agenda for this meeting. Instructions to connect to the meeting are provided on the agenda. The preferred audio connection is the telephone and not the microphone and speakers on your computer. The phone number and access code will be provided as part of your connection to the meeting. During each call for comments from board members and speakers, we will ensure that all comments can be accommodated, that com can be accommodated or heard before proceeding with the agenda. This is an official business meeting of the Dental Board of California. The board welcomes public comments on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comments prior to the board taking any action or after any report on any agenda item. The DCA moderator will explain the process for providing public comments shortly. For individuals participating via WebEx, when called upon, the moderator will give the individual permission to unmute themselves, and they will have two minutes to make public comment. The moderator will audibly announce when 30 seconds remain to conclude the public comment. After the two minutes have lapsed, the individual will be placed back on mute. Only one public comment per agenda item is allowed per attendee. Depending on the number of people who want to testify on a particular agenda item, a total time limit may be imposed by the chair. We ask all speakers to please stay on topic and not repeat testimony already provided. If you agree with that testimony, please state your name and that you are in support of any of the comments previously provided. I would now ask the DCA moderator to please explain how public comments will be taken during this meeting. This is the moderator of the meeting. For the purposes of today's meeting, when the board president opens public comment, members of the public who would like to provide public comment at our DCA location in Sacramento can approach the table and microphone at the front of the room. For those joining via WebEx, we will be utilizing the WebEx question and answer feature to facilitate public comment. When the board reaches a point in the agenda at which public comment is appropriate, the question and answer feature will be turned on and members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by inserting the phrase, I would like to make a comment in the question box, which is typically in the lower right hand corner of your screen. We'll also be accepting uh, raise hands uh, for public comment. I will then call on the individual and give uh, the individual permission to unmute their microphone. The individual will be given two minutes to speak to make their comments. At the conclusion of two minutes, their microphone will then be muted and we will move on to the next member of the public who has comment. Please note that the question and answer feature is being only used as a means for members of the public to represent that they would like to make a verbal comment. This is not a means to ask questions of the moderator or board members. Questions submitted using this feature will not be answered. When making your comment, please make sure that the comment is directed at the host in the dropdown. While you are free to express criticism or negative views, for the sake of members of the public participating on the call, please do not use profane language when making public comments to the board. I will provide a brief reminder of this approach at the start of each public comment item. And that is it for my instructions. I'll pass it back over to the board president. Thank you, moderator. Dr. Molina, our board secretary, will not be able to join us in person for this meeting. In her absence, I've asked Dr. James Wu, our vice president, to assist with calling the roll for attendance and voting. Thank you, Dr. Yu. I would like to now call this meeting to order and ask Dr. Yu to please call the roll. Okay, this is Dr. James Yu, uh, board vice president. I will now call the roll. Chan? Chan here. Felsenfeld? Felsenfeld here. Falls. Walt Epson, <coughs> Noreen, yes. Mackenzie, Mackenzie yes, present, Medina, Medina, here. Medina present, Molina, Molina Epson, Morrow, Morrow present, Morrow present, Olagi, Olagi present, Olagi present, Pacheco, Pacheco present, Pacheco present, and you present. We have a forum. Thank you, Dr. Yu. We now move on to item number two on the agenda, public comment on items not on the agenda. Before we open public comment on matters not on the agenda, I would like to remind individuals making comments to not discuss pending complaints, pending licensing, licensing applications, or pending disciplinary actions that may later, later become before the board 
for a decision. Such decisions are considered ex parte communications as they could provide information to the board members that is outside of the record in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. Such discussions could, conflict, could create a conflict and lead to a board decision being challenged in superior court. Accordingly, if an individual makes comments on a pending disciplinary matter, the individual will be interrupted. The board can, of course, receive comments regarding the board's processes in general, but it cannot receive comments on specific case circumstances where the decision is still pending. In addition, public comments should address the board as a whole and not individual members. Please be aware that public comment during this agenda item should, be, should provide information to the board members and it is not a discussion point between the board members and the public. The only action board members can take right now is to listen to comments and decide whether they want a future agenda item on this topic. Though this may seem at times like the board members are not being responsive, following these guidelines is critical to ensure the rules of the Open Meeting Act are followed to avoid compromising the speaker's goals or the board's mission. In the interest of time, as we have done in the past, we would like to request that a public comment not repeat statements made by a private commenter. If you are in support of the statement made by a prior individual and your comments have already been made, please just state your name and association uh, and your support for the previous commenter. Legislative hearings regularly use this practice as a good way to uh, ensure that we can hear from everyone today. Are there any in-person public comments today? Seeing none, uh, are there any public comments from individuals participating via WebEx? DCA moderator, please facilitate the lines for public comment. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I, sh um, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment for items not on the agenda, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. We will now move on to agenda item number three, discussion and possible action on the May 12th, 13th, 2022 and the June 28th, 2022 board meeting minutes. I will take them individually. Let's start with the May, 20, May 12th and 13th meeting. Is there any board member discussion or comments on the minutes? Uh, this is the moderator. I apologize. Um, as I was closing the Q&A, it seems someone uh, posted in there, right? As I was, uh, uh, Do you want me to open it back up to see who wanted to make public comment on items not in the agenda? Certainly, that'll be fine. Okay, my apologies. No, that's Got it right. right as I was closing it. <laughs> All right. So it looks like I have a request from comment um, from... I tell Cobbler and uh, Mr. Cobbler, you'll be given two minutes to speak and a 30 second warning. Uh, please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Looks like I have you signed in twice, so I'm going to try one um, login and then if that doesn't unmute, we'll try the other. All right, you are unmuted. Okay, it doesn't look like that login works, so I'm going to try the other one. Okay, and you are unmuted. Um, and unfortunately, um, Mr. Cobbler, it doesn't look like we can hear you. I can read off the comment that they wrote in the Q&A feature if you'd like. Go ahead and do that. Okay. We might be back uh, later today. We have an item on <laughs> credits, but what's the comment? 
Uh, says Dr. Jacoby and Raquel Cobbler are online uh, representing Central Regional Dental. I think she was just identifying herself. That's fine. We'll be speaking gotcha. about that later today. Thank you Thank very you. much. Let us go back to the approval or the comments about the May 12th and 13th, 2022 minutes. Are there any board member comments? I have one since, no, oh, Dr. Moore, did you want to? Go ahead, sir. Well, before you do, let me make one quick comment. On page 20 of the PDF, Dr. Guy Atchison, who represents the AGD, uh, his name is spelled incorrectly. It says Atcherson with an R in there. That's an editorial comment. If you could just correct that, that would be great. All right, Dr. Morrow. Microphone, please. Thank you, sir. I move adoption approval of the minutes for May 12 and 13 with the spelling correction as noted by uh, President Felsenfeld. Thank you. Is there a second? Pacheco second. Thank you, Ms. Pacheco. All right, we have before us any board discussion on the motion now? Seeing none, is there any public discussion on the motion? Moderator, please open the WebEx for us. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and this is the moderator seeing none. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Please do. Thank you, moderator. We now move on to the minutes of the June 28th, 2022 meeting. Is there any? We, we had to take the vote. Oh, we didn't vote. Sorry. Excuse me, you're right. Thank you. Uh, let's take the vote then. Yeah, Dr. The Mio. motion is to approve May 12 to 13, 2022 meeting minutes. And now I will call the roll. Chen? Chen, I. Chen, I. Person fell? Aye. Person fell? Aye. Ford? Absent. Lorraine? Lorraine, aye. Mackenzie? Uh, Mackenzie, abstain. Mackenzie, abstain. <coughs> Medina? Medina, aye. Medina, aye. Molina? Molina, absent. Morrow? Morrow, aye. Morrow, aye. Olagi? Olagi, aye. Olagi, aye. Pacheco? Pacheco, aye. Pacheco, aye. And you, aye. We have a quorum. Nope. We have approved the minutes. Yeah, approved the minutes. Thank you. <laughs> We're even, Dr. Yu. Okay. Uh, we now go on, if I'm not mistaken, to the June 28th, 2022 minutes. Is there any board member discussion about the actual document for the minutes? I'm seeing none. So at this point, is there any public comment on this? Nope. Let's... Uh, Let's make a motion to approve, and then we'll have public comment. Is there a motion? Anyone wants to make a motion to approve? I see Dr. Chan. I'll second. Uh, what are you doing, Dr. Chan? You have to say it. Motion to approve the June 28, 22 minutes. Thank you. And Dr. McKenzie is seconding it. McKenzie seconds. Okay, thank you. Is there any further board comment about the motion? Okay, now we'll go to public comment on the motion to approve the minutes of the 20, June 28th meeting. DCA moderator, please facilitate public comment. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? All right, thank you. All right, we now have to take the vote. Dr. Yu, would you please call for the vote on the June 28th minutes? Okay, the motion is to approve the June 28, 2022 meeting minutes. Thank you. And Chen? Chen, I. Chen, I. Felsenfeld? Felsenfeld, I. Ford? Epson? 
Lorraine? Abstain. Lorraine, abstain. Mackenzie? Mackenzie, yes. Mackenzie, aye, yes. Medina? Medina, abstain. Medina, abstain. Molina? Molina, absent. Morrow? Morrow, aye. Morrow, aye. Olagi? Olagi, yes. Olagi, yes. Pacheco? Pacheco, aye. Pacheco, aye. And you, aye. Okay, the minute approved. Thank you, Dr. Yu. We now move on to item number four on the agenda, the board president report. Before I begin my report, I have the pleasure of making a few announcements that impact the board. The first is the appointment of Dr. Joni A. Forge, who has a practice at the CDI Dental Group in Long Beach, and also Dr. Yogita Thacker of Foster City, who is the chief dental officer at the Ravenswood Family Health Network. Both individuals were very recently named to the board by Governor Newsom, and the proximity of their appointments, unfortunately, did not allow them to join us in, in, in this meeting because of the time commitments at this point. But we do look forward to meeting them in November and properly introducing them. So we're back up two more members, and that's great. As I will mention in my president's report in a few minutes, I've been working diligently with the Department of Consumer Affairs to keep the transition to a new executive officer going forward smoothly and getting help in our functions for the interim period. Seated to my left is Dr. Tracy Montez, and she's no stranger to those of us who have been participating at the board meetings for any length of time. She is presently on loan to us from the DCA from a position as chief of the Division of Programs and Policy Review to act as the interim assistant executive officer and provide temporary leadership to our staff. Tracy, as she would like to be called, has been working with the board over the years, and as we have made a number of changes to the licenses, to licensing of dentists and dental assistants in her OPEs experience. Uh, she has an excellent understanding of the functions of this board and at many levels with her DCA experience. Tracy has jumped in to help and has been a tremendous asset to us, even in the short time of her participation. Welcome, Tracy. We look forward to your continuing leadership in this position to our staff. Would you like to say a few words before before I continue with my report. I will just say uh, good afternoon, and I'm happy to be here, and I will speak a bit more about uh, the board during my report. Thank you. Thank you. We're very happy to have you here. As part of my report also, I will report on other things that I have done. Uh, I attended the Dental Hygiene Board of California meeting on July 23rd. Uh, I discussed changes and issues that were going along uh, and we haven't seen them since November, so I talked about who our elected officers were for this year. Uh, I also broke, I brought them up to date on our transition to the new executive officer, which is now out of date because we've, we've gone past that right now. They discussed the elimination of the practical exam for the RDA, the, uh, the, uh, the, the RH, the registered hygiene, the hygienist, which was coincidentally consistent. I talked about ours for the RDAEF, and they were talking about eliminating those for the hygienists at the same time. So that was consistent, that a, 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 good, a good fit. We talked a little bit about the regulatory process for SB 501 and that it's tracking well. And we let them know about an emergency regulation package for dentists to administer flu and COVID max, uh, vaccines. Dr. Yu and I attended the DCA Consumer Affairs update. We have one of those every quarter. And then I've been working very closely, as I indicated earlier, with the Department of Consumer Affairs executive team on assisting us with the transition for a permanent executive officer. This has taken a modest amount of time and a lot of meetings and discussions, but we're now in a good position, and the job has been put out for interested applicants to apply to this point. It is my understanding that yesterday was the deadline for applicants, so we should start seeing within the next few days perhaps a, a series of people that are going to be ready for interview. And that concludes my report. Is there any board member discussion on my report? Seeing none, moderator, would you please facilitate public comment on my report? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, ma'am, please. 
We're going to move on to agenda item number five, the Acting Assistant Executive Officer Report. I'm going to ask Tracy Montez, as we introduced her a moment ago, as the Acting Assistant Executive Officer to present this agenda item. Thank you, Dr. Felsenfeld. Um, so as you are aware, um, the former Interim Executive Officer, Sarah Wallace, um, resigned and moved on to uh, another opportunity within state service, and um, I had the honor of being requested by the Department of Consumer Affairs Director uh, Kirk Meyer to step into this role and help provide some oversight of the dental board. So this is my third week uh, in this position and um, I want to let the board know that you have a really great team um, at the board who have been working very hard to keep things going, um, as has been reported in prior reports, we do have a rather high vacancy rate, which has made uh, processing applications a bit challenging, as you've heard from your students and, and stakeholder groups and so forth. But um, again, working with the department, we have been able to bring in um, some support that will be starting in September to help process applications and assist in some other areas. So the goal is to get um, caught up as well as hire individuals so that we can keep things rolling and be responsive uh, to consumer protection as well as getting folks out there into the work world. Um, so I just want you to know that it has been key having this partnership um, with the department, very appreciative of it. And then again, extremely appreciative to the staff who have really jumped in, made me feel welcome, prepped me for this meeting, and made things have made things very easy to transition. So um, again, I just really want to recognize the staff because they have been working amazing. And um, to let you know too, as far as vacancies, it's very challenging in state service, even in private industry right now. People are having a hard time filling vacancies and it's challenging, but um, you know, I, I, uh, I feel very positive about uh, bringing some good folks over to the board to shore up these good folks too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tracy. Is there any board member discussion about Tracy's report? Well, seeing none, will the, uh, are there any public comments from the individual participating via WebEx. The DCA moderator, please facilitate the lines for public comment. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Thank you, yes. We now move on to agenda item number six, report on the Department of Consumer Affairs activities, which may include updates on the department's administrative services, human resources, enforcement, information technology, communications and outreach, as well as legislative, regulatory, and policy manners. I think we have uh, Brian Clifford. Is that you over there, sir? I think we have Mr. Clifford on the... Uh, on the line from the executive office, please go ahead, Mr. Mr. Clifford. We're looking forward to your report. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me an opportunity to provide the Department of Consumer Affairs update today. First, I'd like to talk about public meetings. The governor signed Senate Bill 189 on June 30th, which reinstitutes through July 1st of next year the remote meeting provisions of the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act that were in place during the pandemic. The changes took effect immediately upon signing. Please be aware that DCA wants you to have the right meeting for the business of your board, while still taking into consideration both costs and public participation. We're asking boards to still track the costs of meetings, even those where there isn't travel, and also use WebEx as much as possible to allow the public to attend remotely, especially as COVID-19 numbers continue to rise. DCA is still asking boards to complete the public meeting survey to assist in tracking these costs 
for your board meetings in order to be able to prepare costs for in-person and WebEx meetings since this legislative change is only in place for this fiscal year. We have distributed the surveys to all boards and bureaus and asked that they could be completed within 30 days after each meeting held. Should you have any questions, please reach out to DCA member relations. Though legislation is passed allowing remote meetings, we are reminding boards that choose to hold in-person meetings of the safety measures, best practices, and recommendations for holding public meetings. When planning for upcoming meetings, please remember, all board members and staff are expected to follow the state and local public health guidelines that apply in the area where meetings are held. Face coverings are strongly recommended for all board members and staff at meetings. The California Department of Public Health strongly recommends that individuals continue to mask in indoor settings. Please post face covering guidance signage at your meeting check-in and entrances, entrance as well. Prior to meeting in person and at a remote location, members need to submit vaccine verification to DCA's Office of Human Resources or be subject to COVID-19 testing. Moving on to our enlightened licensing project, we are pleased to announce that the initial Report of the enlightened licensing project is now available and was distributed to all boards and bureaus on May 13th. This innovative and collaborative project was started to streamline and enhance licensing processes by utilizing the knowledge and expertise of subject matter experts within DC boards and bureaus. This project was conducted in partnership with the Board of Registered Nursing. After a thorough assessment of some of BRN's licensing processes, the project co-chairs provided recommendations to introduce new ideas and implement best practices for critical licensing activities. DCA held a brown bag event on June 1st to review the recommendations with all boards and bureaus, as we hope that other boards and bureaus can learn from this report and implement recommendations where applicable. We believe it is so important to learn from each other and to share our knowledge. We will be turning to enforcement next and we'll be reviewing the enforcement processes at a board through this enlightenment process, enlightenment process, utilizing enforcement subject matter experts. Two other brown bags I'd like to speak about. DCA recently held a brown bag meeting with executive officers and bureau chiefs on July 5th to roll out changes to DCA's regulation development and approval process. These changes were also discussed and approved by DCA's executive officer and bureau chief cabinet. DCA shared documentation on the process and changes with all boards and bureaus. On August 10th, DCA held a brown bag meeting on the topic of social media. The presentation included an overview of social media best practices, content examples, security, and more. A copy of the presentation was provided to participants. If you have any questions or requests related to social media, please contact DCA's Deputy Director of Communication, Monica Vargas. Moving on to uh, workforce and succession planning. DCA takes a proactive and strategic approach to the recruitment and training of its skilled and diverse workforce. To achieve this approach, DCA is updating its annual workforce and succession plan. Part of the process is the DCA recently requested that boards and bureau, bureaus complete a workforce survey. Responses will be used with other information about DCA's workforce to inform decisions and support DCA's new strategic plan. Further, this process facilitates meeting CalHR's requirement that all state organizations with civil service employees maintain current workforce and succession plans. And speaking of staffing, DCA is pleased to announce that Nicole Lay was hired on July or on June 24th as the Deputy Director of DCA's Office of Administrative Services. With more than 20 years of state service experience, Nicole has dedicated 10 of those years to DCA. Most recently, she served as acting deputy director of OAS, where she was responsible for overseeing the business functions of the human resources, fiscal operations, and business services offices. Prior to this role, Nicole was the chief of DCA's Office of Human Resources. She also previously served at the Contractor State License Board and the Department of Motor Vehicles. We are very excited to have her as part of DCA's executive leadership team. Additionally, Olivia Trejo, has been appointed as DCA's Chief of, of the Office of Human Resources as of August 1st. Olivia has over 22 years of human resources experience in state government and the last nine years have been with DCA's OHR. She began her career in 2000 at the Department of Insurance, then at the Department of Real Estate, and most recently as the DCA Assistant Human Resources Chief for nearly five years. And lastly, Taylor Schick was appointed DCA's Chief Fiscal Officer in July. Taylor has more than 16 years of state service experience, all with DCA. 
He began his career in 2006 as a budget analyst and most recently as the DCA budget officer. As the new DCA chief, DCA's chief fiscal officer, Taylor will lead the dedicated accounting and budget teams. Lastly, I'd like to cover training. Board members are required to complete the board member orientation training or better known as BMOT within one year of appointment and reappointment. The final training of 2022 will be offered on October 12th. Members can register through DCA's learning management system. BMOT is required for new appointed and new appointed members, but it is available as a refresher for all members and executive officers. Please reach out to DCA member relations with any questions. As always, DCA is here to help, and if there's anything we can do to assist, please just let us know. We would like to turn it back over to the board president. Thank you, Mr. Clifford. Is there any, any board member discussion or questions about Mr. Clifford's report? Seeing none, is there any in-person public comment? Seeing none, are there any public comments from individuals participating via WebEx? DCA moderator, please facilitate the lines for public comment. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. Okay, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. Mr. Clifford, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to spend some time with us. Uh, go back to work, sir, it's all good. We now move on to uh, agenda item number seven, the budget report. Uh, Wilbert Rombara, the administrative services manager is gonna present this agenda item. Is that correct, Wilbur? All right, there you go. And he's gonna come up now and discuss the budget. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Wilbur Rambala, and I'm the Administrative Services Manager. I will be presenting the budget report, which can be referenced on pages 37 through 42 of your meeting materials. These materials provide substantial information on the board's budget, both revenue and expenditures, and the projected fund balance moving forward. I would like to highlight some of the information and provide a little, more, a little bit more clarity on them. There is also a budget memo prepared and included in the materials that will have this information and highlights to other budget related items. As a refresher for board members and new members, I will go into some detail on our budget documents for clarity. <clears throat> Page 40 of the document is the board's fund condition statement. This document is read top to bottom and then left to right. The fund condition has been updated with 2020-2021 20, prior year actual revenues and expenditures. The board began prior year 2022-21-22 with an adjusted beginning balance of $12.4 million. As of fiscal month 11, the board collected approximately $8.5 million in revenue and expended approximately $16.2 million in direct expenditures. There were additional statewide expenditures of $2.1 million for total expenditures of $18.3 million. Expenditure projections as well as revenue projections may change with actual returns in the remaining fiscal year. The board ended 2021-2022 with just over $12 million in reserve balance. That now moves to the top of the next column of the fund condition and becomes the beginning balance for the next fiscal year. You will also see that there was 7.2 months in reserve. Months in reserve is the amount of time the board can continue normal operations without any new incoming revenues. A healthy program uh, is considered to have funds of at least six to 12 months in reserve. The dental board in conjunction with the budget office will continue to monitor these expenditures and revenues and report back to the board with monthly projections as future fiscal months close. You will find these figures on page 41 to 42, which show specific category totals for expenditures and revenues. 
On page 41, the expenditure projection report displays a detailed breakdown of expenditures for the state dentistry fund by line item. For prior year and prior year actuals are displayed in the green column. Current year budget and year-to-date expenditures are displayed in the blue column and expense projections for year-end spending and the remaining balance in the orange column. Based on reports received by the Department of Consumer Affairs, the board is projected to revert approximately $2.6 million at the end of fiscal year 21-22. Revenues remain constant and expenditures are anticipated to increase 3% per annual year. One of the main factors driving expenditure increases in future years is a result of personal service adjustments. These include general salary increases as well as employee compensation and retirement rate adjustments. The Budget Office includes an ongoing 3% increase to expenditures on the fund condition statement to account for these ongoing incremental adjustments. Future year months in reserve go down due to, due to the revenue being held constant to the Governor's budget and the expenditures assumed to be fully expended plus 3% that I mentioned previously. The fund condition does not include increased enforcement expenditures, which include higher than normal caseload and increased cost of investigation. These additional costs could create pressure to the board's fund in out years. And lastly, we would like to note that any future legislation or unanticipated events could result in the board's need for additional resources. The board staff will keep the line of communication with the budget office open to monitor the board's fund condition statement and expenditures and revenues. There is no action item on this agenda, and this concludes the budget report. Thank you, Mr. Ambar. Uh, is any board member discussion on this report or questions? Dr. Chan and Dr. Lorenz is next. Good morning, Wilbur. Hello. Um, on page 38, general fund loan, um, in my very naive um, read of this, how is, number one, how is interest calculated? Does the increase of prime interest rate have anything to do with it? So the interest rate is calculated, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact calculations, but it is uh, included on the fund condition and that will be included in the, um, in the income from surplus money investment. So is it fixed? A fixed interest rate or? Yes, it is a fixed interest rate. I, I don't have the exact number right now, but I can get you that, okay. that information. The question is, is it tied to increasing prime? No, no it's, a, it's a number based on what was provided for in uh, uh, the uh, government code. The second question is, the $5 million loan transfer, is that a lump sum that was transferred? Yes. So again, in my very naive look at this, even at 5% interest for $5 million is 250000 not 25000 Again, it's real naive, but Do you see where I'm looking at? If it's if the interest rate is five percent on the lump sum of five million, and if we take an assumption of five percent, that's two hundred and fifty thousand. Since twenty twenty? But again, there's there's a gap between two hundred and fifty thousand and twenty five thousand. I'll have to get back to you. The, re, the, the actual repayment is for 23 24, uh -huh. and uh, I will get the exact amount All right, um, thank you. of that. Thank you. Dr. Lorraine. Uh, good morning, William. Um, I wanted to ask you, because I don't think I've seen this, is this the first merged report from the Dental Assistance Fund and the State Dental Board? I don't No, this is the fourth. This is the fourth? Yes. I, are we able to um, separate? Still, the dental assistance yes, expenditures we can, and we can, income easily. Yes, we can still track expenditures for the dental assisting program and the dental board. Um, it's all based on the fund codes. I was reading here that in July. Okay, thank you. I was reading that in July um, it closed. Uh, they finally merged the 
too, so that's what I thought it was the first one. No, so it, it did it did close. So, so we've been showing the, so what happened is any remaining funds uh, that were in the dental assisting program were brought over to the dental board, dent state dentistry fund, because any remaining items that needed to be paid within those two years were were paid and it was brought over to our fund. And the, and the projected balance of 2.9 million, it's gonna re, when is when is that gonna be transferred over? It has been. It, pardon? It has been transferred over. It has been transferred, yes. okay, thank you. You said it was currently working to transfer it, but it, it, it has been transferred. Okay, it says it's, uh, the budget office is currently working with the Department of Finance to facilitate the transfer. It's been transferred. It's already? Okay, thank you. We good? Thank you, Dr. Lorraine. Any other board comment? Is there any in-person public? Felton, um, I just have a structural I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, request. On page uh, 41, can can that be printed um, bigger than like five font? <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> Yes, that will be noted for <laughs> right, Mr. Make, it, make it readable. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Pacheco. Any other comments on that by the board? All right, we're good. Is there any in-person public comment on the budget? Seeing none, are there any public comments from individuals participating on WebEx? DCA moderator, please facilitate the lines for public comment. This is the moderator. And at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. And it looks like we have a request for comment from Karen Munoz. And Karen, you'll be given two minutes to speak and a 30 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. All right, and you are unmuted. Could you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can. Hi, um, this is Karen Munoz. I'm actually the budget manager over with DCA budget office. I just wanted to um, make a quick comment. Uh, you guys were asking questions regarding the interest rate of the $5 million loan uh, or the 500, 500, I believe it was $500,000. I apologize, I don't have that up in front of me. But the interest rate is a fixed interest rate at the time that that loan was paid. And so that will come back in, projected to come in a bit, I believe in budget year, budget year plus one. We are not capturing that in your fund condition at this time, and I apologize for that. I will get those numbers for Wilbert and provide that to him by the end of today to, in, to update that, but that will be an increase um, on that one line item. So you'll see that negative coming out and the positive coming in. Um, also wanted to add um, for the fund transfer that did take effect. We've already got an um, executive um, order for that to come in. It should come in as of the end of last fiscal year. So we should see that in our fiscal month 13 financials when we are, when we are actually able to close it. Um, and I believe it's around $2.9 million or just under 3 million. Just wanted to share that information with you as well. That will be transferring over from the dental assistance fund to the dental fund. You can also see that amount on the fund condition statement. It's under current year 22-23, and it's that 2,877,000. Thank you. Any other public uh, on WebEx comments? This is the moderator. Appears there are no further requests for comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Thank you. Please do that. Thank you, Mr. Rumbauer. We now go on to item number eight on the agenda, enforcement, a review of statistics and trends. I'm going to ask Mr. Ryan Blonian. Did I get that right, sir? Very good. All right. My well, name is Felsenfeld. You get sensitive. Mr. Blonian, who is the acting chief of enforcement for the field offices, he'll come and present this agenda item. Go ahead, Mr. Blonian. So in your book on page 43 starts the enforcement statistics. Um, 
They're not real exciting, but I can tell you that we're putting fresh eyes on the processes and the cases and trying to eliminate some of the internal time to speed these times up, and that's an ongoing process right now. So I'm not gonna go through this report uh, line by line. Um, as far as trends and, and new happenings with enforcement, last month, the Sacramento Enforcement Office sworn peace officers went to Southern California with our sworn peace officers down there. Together, we worked for 10 days pretty much straight through and addressed 45 unlicensed dental practice uh, cases. Um, out of that, we have five cases that are being pursued for criminal prosecution for unlicensed practice of dentistry. Um, we worked in LA County, Riverside County, San Bernardino County, Orange County, and San Diego County. And uh, it is our hope that um, that put a dent in that problem a little bit and uh, hopefully we uh, steered some people to go get some licensed uh, hygienic dental care taken care of that we're waiting for treatment in some of those locations. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Blonian. Do you have any more to report for us? That's all I have for you right now. Excellent. Hopefully putting a dent into it. Is there any board comment on this? Dr. Morrow and then Dr. Chan. Microphone, please, Dr. Morrow. How were you made aware of these unlicensed practices so that you could uh, investigate them? We're complaint driven. So these complaints came in through the mail, anonymously online, or through the telephone, or we had licensed dentists who were fixing the problems that people uh, had happened to them at the unlicensed dentist and they took that information and passed it on to us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morrow. I think Dr. Chan, did you have something? Go ahead, sir. Hi. Um, on page 49 of the materials enforcement statistics, um, first of all, I do want to comment that having the graphical display of the aging of the cases is really helpful to see where we're going with these cases. Um, but with the enforcement statistics, we have from 49 through 52, and they're raw numbers. It's helpful to see a graphical display of the trends because we might have learned something from 2021 and 2020 when the pandemic hit. And um, just seeing raw numbers, we're not able to see that trend as readily. When you see the drop suddenly, it pops up, for example, on 2019 to 2020, there were pending cases from the prior year, 56 to 13. That's a drop. That's a significant drop. So I'm not versed enough to see raw numbers to see how these trends will evolve over the uh, last three years. But when you see the graph, it jumps out. I wrote the note in my book. And uh, if I did the graphs, it would be color crayons and construction paper. So, I got it. Um, we'll, we'll get somebody who's more uh, proficient in that arena to help us with that. Thank you. Any other board comments on this? All right, Mr. Bologna, sit tight for a second, but we're going to ask for uh, in-person public comments. Dr. Witch is approaching. This is going to be a comment. We cannot have a conversation. Understood. Uh, Dr. Bruce Witcher, just commenting for myself, um, I know that the uh, board investigative staff carries a very heavy caseload, and I believe they continue to carry the probation workload as well. And I guess um, they're, I'm assuming they're unfilled positions because that's true across all the state government as far as law enforcement goes. But it is a concern when I see a large number of unassigned cases, and I know you know this and you're doing what you can, but I, I do tend to look at that number because I think that's an important one because if the cases are not assigned, they're not being worked and they're aging. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Witcher. Any other in-person public comment? Seeing none, are there public comments from individuals who are participating via WebEx? DCA moderator, please facilitate the lines for public comment. This is a moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests.
All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Thank you, yes. Uh, Mr. Blinden, hang on for one moment. Tracy uh, would like to make a few comments on some things that she's been working on for the last week or two as she's been here. Yes, so as I mentioned that we were bringing in uh, assistance with processing applications. Um, the department is also assisting the board with triaging um, these pending cases. Ryan and his team have been working closely with um, our experts, and so we are looking to fill vacancies, and we are also have strategies to triage these. And again, I, I want to thank Ryan for bringing to my attention this operation that they did down in Southern California because he just humbly handed me this update and I said, hey, we need to bring that to the board's attention so that you're aware of what, what they're doing. So again, working hard and just really appreciate the collaboration. Thank you. Clearly one of the most important things we do to protect the health of the public. Thank you, sir. Mr. Blanion, we'll see you in a bit. All right. We now move on to agenda item number 9A, and that's the report from the Commission on Dental Competency Assessment, Western Regional Board, Examining Board, and the Council of Interstate Testing Agencies. I believe Dr. Guy Champagne is with us again. Dr. Champagne, welcome. Have a seat. Tell us what you need to tell us. Do we, do we have some slides coming up? Okay, thank you. No, push the, the green the green light should be lit. Push it. Push the button. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity of giving you an update on the ADEX exam and some changes really nationally in the examination process. So really this is kind of an exciting presentation for me because I graduated dentistry in the seventies, had to take two regional boards to do and they had nothing to do with what I ever practiced. I'm an OMS. So they had nothing to do. But my brother, who's 10 years younger than me, he's a physician, and he got to go any place he wanted with one exam. So as of August 1st, and that's why this is kind of timely, we really have that situation. Dentistry's reached parity with medicine and nursing and physical therapy, occupational therapy, every place else. So on our agenda item, it looks like we're three different testing agencies presenting. We're not. This is one testing agency at CDCA RebCETA. We have merged for the benefit of the profession. And as of August, as of January 1st, at every dental school in the United States, every dental student will take the same exam given by one agency and will be able to go anywhere they want except for New York and Delaware. And that is something that we, it's been a dream, long, uh, way too long in coming. And it's a non-patient based exam, which is I think equally important. But I do want to give credit, I, if those of you, most of you won't know the history of medicine, but California was the impetus for the five tests coming together and having the US MLE series. And California was really a lot of the impetus for ADEX. So Dr. Ariane Trelay, who left, was the first secretary of ADEX back in 2003. So this has been a 20-year journey. So I'm really happy to uh, be able to um, address you today. And really the focus of it today is to tell you about how the exam is performing, what we see in, uh, from candidates, the three people you see there were the people who um, really presented and reviewed the statistics, but we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so we're gonna go over the dental class of 2022. We're gonna go over their performance of the five parts of the examination. Um, now, we're gonna first talk about prosthodontics and endodontics, and we traditionally give that separate. Now, California schools, uh, for half of them, this is new. So for USC, UOP, and UCSF, they've been participating in ADEX for years, so they've, they're, they're experienced with it. But traditionally at the dental schools in California, everything has been given at one time over two days. We don't do that nationally. So most schools do prosthodontics and endodontics in the fall, and they do their restorative and scaling in the spring. So they only concentrate on one. At, in that's not what's happening uh, in California for most of the schools this year. We have met with Western, Loma Linda, and UCLA within the last couple of months, and we have an ongoing process of onboarding them so the, the students will be comfortable. But we, what we wanna show you is just the performance. This has, of course, always been a non-patient-based component. 
in prosthodontics and endodontics when a, all candidate performance of dental students is sent back to the dental school. So they will get pictures of their actual performance. If they're unsuccessful, they'll get a picture of it. So that goes to the faculty. It does not go to the candidate, but it's so the candidate can re, uh, remediate with the faculty. They can go over and uh, see how they did. You can see that these are the co most common errors. You have this PowerPoint, so I don't really have to uh, go over the details, but for those people who are unsuccessful, um, this is, these are the reasons. And it's commonly the bridge factor is, is an issue, as well as, in, interestingly enough, under reduction is the most common error in prosthodontics. So we'll move on to the next one, which is endodontics. Endodontics has the lowest overall initial pass rates. These, this is an initial pass rate. Um, the most common cause of error in the anterior, which is a complete endodontic treatment, is either overfill or underfill, as you might imagine. Uh, in the posterior, it's the size of the access opening or perforation. So that has been pretty uniform in endodontics uh, over the years. It's interesting because on the red exam, which is a legacy exam now, it expires in December 31st. It won't be given as an exam anymore. Um, but their pass rates were about the same and their failure rates were for the same reason. Next slide. So this is the periodontal scaling. This is not periodontics. We test periodontics on the OSCE because what dentists do is diagnosis, treatment planning, prognosis, all of those other factors. They do not do scaling. They do not do charting. They do not do probing. That's according to the occupational analysis. Dental hygienists do that usually in the practice, so we don't have that as part of the test, but interpretation of those that data, of course, is part of the OSCE, and that's woven through all the case-based presentations. But I, what I want you to point out is the initial pass rate is extraordinarily high. It's 99.5%. It is not a required component of the ADEX exam. It was not a required component of the REB exam. In fact, Quite frankly, if you look at this psychometrically, I don't know we're testing much. We include it only because some states require it. There's a 100% pass rate on a retake when any exam that doesn't make a selection doesn't function to do anything anyway. So thankfully, it's all non-patient because when it was patients, it was that's even worse statistic. So let's move past that. California does not require the periodontal scaling because we tested on the OSCE. So we how they. Uh, practice. Now, but now we're going to get into some of the things that I think is going to be some interesting information because we compare patient-based exam to the competent exams. Now, the competent tooth is not the same as any other tooth. It is not a type of tooth. It is different than any other academic product. They don't use this process on any other product, and the whole part of it is to increase variability and introduce variability so that no two teeth are the same, so you can't game the exam, but we can evaluate judgments. One of the things I think you can see is that the pass rate is, initial pass rate is lower on the competent than it is on a patient, mainly because the candidate can select the patient. Now, if you look, the, the number percentage of patients is dwindling. So this last year, it was only 5% patient. There is only one state that I know of that still requires patient-based exam. That's Wyoming. So I think we'll be at 99% next year. And uh, Dr. Morrow and I were talking before this about how change is difficult. This was a difficult thing to sell to dental boards, but it's actually a better exam because it's fairer, it's more uniform, there's a, inc there's a uniform challenge to everybody. But one of the things that if you look at the common errors, they different. they're different. They, they're different in patient versus uh, the competent. In fact, now if we look at last year, the patient-based exam carries didn't even rank because they selected lesions so small there there was never carries. You prepared, you prepared the tooth and they were gone. But these are the things that we see. So in the preparation, uh, remaining carries, adjacent tooth damage, and outline extension, which can be under or over, usually over. And then in the restoration, the things that we all know, marginal integrity and interproximal contact. Next slide. 
posterior restorative looks about the same. It's a little more difficult than the anterior, um, though they functionally look differently because one's an indirect restoration by definition. I mean, preparation all the time. It's from the lingual. Uh, this, this is a little larger and um, just so you know, they are not on the same T, so the candidate is given a radiograph that will have one anterior and one posterior lesion, but that, that hypodont will have eight lesions around the mouth. So they will vary from uh, exam to exam. Next slide. This is the ultimate pass rate on the OSCE. So the ultimate pass rate um, comports really very closely to the USMLE. So there, the ultimate uh, pass rate is 99.4%, which is what we see in the USMLE exams and other exams for ultimate pass rate. So it's pretty consistent. Next slide. So let's compare the candidate performance. Next slide for, for patients and non-patients. Keep going. Next slide. So. This is actually the, the composite data, and you'll see patients and non-patients, because we had to go back to non-patient years. On the scaling, there is no difference. Now, this is just of interest to you because you don't require it, but there is no difference. So I think the same thing we're seeing. I think uh, the scaling exams have issues. Next slide. And we can, we can that's the same thing. You can go to the next slide. And th this is just the type of analysis we do. So uh, they're looking at to make sure that the data falls within one standard deviation. And um, I am not a psychometrician. I know OPS is here and other people who have experience. And if they want to go over that, they're welcome to. But I don't want this to be oral conscious sedation. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Okay, restorative, and this is really the interesting part when comparing patients and non-patients. Next slide. So if we look at the anterior and posterior, first of all, you'll see the trend. Uh, in 2019, it was all patients, and in 2022, there was 8% patients. The reason there was 8% and it was a slight uptick is because the year before was all COVID, so that 5% were all candidates taken prior to COVID. So after that, it was 100% non-patient um, because Nevada, at last year, Nevada, Georgia, and Wyoming required patient-based exams. That caused that really drove the the 8% patients. It's it's not as good an exam. Um, if you look at the pass rates, the pass rate's much higher than patient. That's almost always happens if you give a candidate the opportunity to bring in their own test material. And they spend most of the time um, selecting for that. Next slide. So here are the most common errors. You can see they stay pretty consistent across the board. It really doesn't matter. But the interesting thing, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute, if you look at caries remaining on patients, it doesn't exist anymore. So if, if, if I could go to 2022 and show you the patient-based exams, none of them failed for that, essentially, for caries because they were the number of candidate patients were so low that they were able to everybody was able to select for the for the patient they wanted but that's you have this so you, you i don't need to review it but here's the common causes of candidates being unsuccessful next slide and this is the restoration so you, that was a the preparation then the restoration interproximal contact is the highest cause of failure for across all restorations, anterior and posterior, and then marginal excess would be the highest cause of uh, failure next, and then marginal deficiency. So you, know, you can go to the next slide. That's good. So same thing with posterior. You can see that the uh, causes of failure remain stay consistent across the years. Um, the interesting thing that the unrecognized exposure was high uh, in 2021 because they didn't realize that the competence are variable. 
So some will have a justified carious exposure. If you manage it properly, that's fine. The overall difficulty is the same. You just They didn't know they were going to have that. They were anticipating that nothing would have an exposure and everything would need modifications, and that was wrong. So we didn't want that to be an assumption. Next slide. But the restoration, it's the same thing, interproximal contact, marginal excess, marginal deficiency, the same things we all look at all the time. Next slide. So this is really the important one. So if you look at the patient-based exams now, only one out of five patients require modification. In other words, you do a, a minimal preparation and all the caries is gone. You never have to demonstrate you diagnosed caries. You never have to demonstrate you knew what to do or how to alter the preparation. 89% of the competent teeth require multiple modifications. And the reason we want that is that's judgment. That's Otherwise, it's just a D1 exercise, cut a preparation and fill a standard, standardized preparation. We don't need, we, that doesn't tell us anything. We want to know what they do for the diagnosis and how they're going to alter the treatment plan and was the diagnosis correct. This is really the meat of why this is a better examination. Of course, that it's a non-patient-based exam, there's no risk to patients, and that's critical as well. So an error does never harms anybody, but we can duplicate all of those errors. If you look at the pass rates, the lowest pass rate is when you've had your modifications denied on the competent. The next lowest pass rate is you have no modifications because you didn't diagnose the decay. So it's interesting that modifications in your judgment plays a critical role in your being able to pass this. And just because your modifications were approved doesn't mean you're going to pass because it doesn't mean you could translate that to the surgical care. Next slide. So that was really it. That's the performance. I, the bottom line is the good news is we have an examination that every dental student is going to be taking in every single dental school. The preparation is the same. The, train, the preparing for the exam is the same. They can go to every jurisdiction but Delaware and New York, including Jamaica if they want to. Um, so there's an added plus. Uh, and that it's a non-patient-based exam, and the non-patient-based exams perform superior to. Not, it's not equivalent. It's superior to the patient-based exam. And I hope I didn't take up too much of your time. And thanks well, thank for your Thank you, Dr. Champagne. We appreciate that. And I'm very impressed that an old surgeon understands all that restorative stuff. I certainly don't. I'm using a lot of words. I don't know what they mean. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's, move, let's move through this. Uh, do, do any of our board members have any comments or questions for Dr. Champagne? And I'm seeing Dr. Lorraine on the end. Go ahead, Lilia. Hello, Dr. Champagne. Uh, uh, when you say 99% uh, pass rate, for example, is 99, is that on the first try or is it on the retake and ADEX? I don't remember. Do do can you take the retake the same day? Or is no. it does it have to be? No. That's a great question. So um, on all of the slides but the ASCII, that was the first time pass rate, because that's the only thing we want to compare. And one of the things we test is not with dental students, but dentists, so no longer in dental school, with retakes, the pass rate goes down. And that's what you want, reliable exam. So we're finding the same things over and over again, dental school, of course, there's remediation. So everything you saw was initial pass rate except for the OSCE. That was an ultimate pass rate because in an OSCE, the, the principles are different in what we're looking at. And I wanted to show it was, compa it was comparable to what the USMLE and the nursing exams um, find as their ultimate pass rate. As far as retakes, the philosophy of ADEX always has been that uh, we believe the results of the exam are reliable. They're not due to chance, and our uh, psychometric analysis shows that. So an immediate retake, especially, remember this started with patients, was be inappropriate. At least we felt that it would be inappropriate um, because uh, you would have to tell a patient they failed yesterday. Do you want them to work on it today? <laughs> we want we want remediation ahead of a, a retake. We don't expect anything different. The other thing is you really can't compare this to to the Reb exam. To be fair, because the scoring is so different, we don't have people clustered at the tipping point. 
we have people at zero and 90 and above. So the scoring system is all critical errors, not a calculated score. Sometimes the philosophy, if you have a calculated score, different. But all the high stakes exams we know about, medicine, nursing, occupational therapy, almost everything doesn't allow immediate retake, national boards as well. So. Well, but we have confidence in the results, so we want them to have remediation before they do a retake. Now, what we do do, and this is different, we offer retakes in the same school. They're not going to have to travel. We come back to the same school. They will take it on their home turf in a, in a, in a situation they're comfortable with. They will have retakes within three to four weeks after the initial exam, but it's not same-day retakes. The other thing is so that students don't feel that retakes is a business thing, the first retake is at no charge. So they take it at no fee. They just can't take it the next day. Any other board questions or comments? Dr. Morrow. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate you coming and spending your time with us. Uh, <clears throat> a situation that came up recently, I believe one of our licensing uh, Codes requires that an examination has not been uh, has not been failed within the last period of time. When students are allowed to, or candidates are allowed to retake a section of the examination that they did not pass, uh, is that examination, the first examination, considered a failure? From a standpoint of if the licensing requirement says you cannot have failed the examination prior and you have failed one section but then retook it and passed it the second time, is that considered a failure? Well, that was another reason we don't do immediate retakes. So that would be a difficult thing to interpret. So our transcripts show every attempt, but there are no attempts on two consecutive days. So they took it in February and failed and took it in March and passed or failed, whatever it happens to be, or to, and then took it in April to pass. It would be the dental, the licensing authorities' rules and regulations that would determine how they handle the pass and the fail. We don't. We require the ADEX rule is this: you get three attempts at each section. They must be each all five sections must or all four sections because periodontal scaling is not required must be completed successfully within 18 months of starting July 1st of your final year in dental school. If you, so you have that period of time to take it. But any time you've had three failures, the whole exam must be started over. So the, the, the passes don't pass through then at that point. But Specifically, there, the incident that I'm referring to was a failure of a section, a single section. Then on the record, we, when we it was recorded submitted that. for licensure, that failure showed, but yet also showed that there was a passing for the same section. But the license was denied because it had failed. So what we record is every attempt at every section. So it's a matter of how do we interpret that. That's correct. And so there are some states, and I'll give you this, my own state, which is Maryland, has an omnibus bill that for all licensing, law licenses, if you fail an exam four times, you can never enter that field, period. You're out. Mm -hmm. So, But it's up to the medical board or the bar or the dental board to apply that in how they look at passes and fails. So ADEX does not tell you. It just gives you a complete transcript of every attempt of every section. Okay. Thank, thank you. Any other board comment on report. If not, is there any in-person comment or questions, uh, or co not questions, public comments in person? I see none. Uh, Dr. Champagne, thank you. I think you can sit down. Appreciate thank you very it, much. Sir. Are there any public comments from individuals who are participating via WebEx? DCA moderator, please facilitate the lines for public comment. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen. 
or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. We move on to agenda item numbers B and C, which are an update on the Department of Consumer Affairs Office of Professional Examination Services acceptance of dental licensing examinations, and then a discussion, and a secondarily there will be a discussion and possible action regarding the Central Regional Testing Agency incorporated dental examination as a pathway. I call on Paige Regali to discuss the uh, first part of this. Good morning or good afternoon, Ms. Regali. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Dr. Felsenfeld, and good afternoon, members of the board. Um, today, I will be presenting agenda items 9B and 9C, which can be found on page 54 of your meeting materials. First, I would like to provide a brief background on agenda item 9B, which is the update on OPEZ's acceptance of dental licensing examinations. In November of 2021, the board received an update from OPEZ representatives regarding the prioritization of dental examinations to be reviewed as well as a presentation sharing concerns regarding the acceptance of multiple dental licensing examinations as a pathway to licensure. The examinations requiring review were prioritized at this meeting. In addition to prioritizing examination review, OPEZ shared concerns about acceptance of multiple examinations as pathways to licensure, licensure, excuse me, specifically that it makes it hard to determine if candidates are being assessed in a standardized manner. Transitioning now to agenda item 9C, which is the discussion and possible action regarding the credits dental examina examination as a pathway to licensure. So to provide a little bit of background on this item, um, the board received an update from the Executive Director of Credits, um, Ms. Shelley Kobler, at the February 2022 meeting. Ms. Kobler provided information on the testing service and advised the board of the acceptance in many other states. Ms. Kobler then requested that the board initiate review of the credits examination as a, pass as a possible pathway to licensure. Also provided separately to you all was a letter um, received from Ms. Kobler on August 22nd of 2022, which summarizes the credits exam. Um, today, the action requested is that the board consider the acceptance of the credits examination as a pathway to licensure by initiating a review of the examination. Further, due to the concerns raised regarding acceptance of multiple licensure examinations, staff do not recommend reviewing the credits examination for licensure in California at this time. Um, OPEZ representatives are here to answer any questions the board may have, as well as representatives from credits. Thank you, Paige. I'm going to ask uh, Tracy to comment a little bit about two things. Number one, OPEZ now has a three-tiered series of things that we have to look at that we, I think we changed a little bit last time, but we, we have that. Let's review what that is real quickly. And then I'd like her to maybe comment on what's involved in doing this from an OPEZ standpoint. Okay, so um, again, uh, OPS is scheduled to review a number of examinations, the INBD and the California Portfolio, as well as the Delosky. So um, their plate is quite full. And um, in addition to our other client boards, of course, um, dental is one of our favorites, or their favorites. <laughs> so um, lots of work to do. But it's, it's important that I share with the board that um, while OPS is doing this work, and again, it is a, a project, a methodology of where you request materials from these organizations, you look at their psychometric data, uh, you have meetings with them. It's a very extensive process. They bring that back. Uh, we utilize to the board, but we also utilize subject matter experts. It involves some board staff for drafting contracts, um, getting us subject matter experts, licensees. So my point is, it's, it's a big project, not only for OPS, but also the board does, the board staff has involvement in this. So. Given the uh, vacancies and the other um, projects and challenges that the board staff faces right now, I do feel that it would be premature to add another pathway. It doesn't mean that it can't happen at some time in the future, but we feel like we have a number of priorities 
that we need to address now. And it would be um, an additional burden to the staff to do this, uh, considering we have licensing and enforcement priorities. And our exams right now are doing quite well. So that's the additional. Um, thank you, Paige, very much uh, elaboration on that. Thank you, Ms. Re Ms. Uh, Regali. Anything else you'd like to add to that right now? Um, that was all I had. You're good? Okay. Is there any board comment on what's going on here? Dr. Chan, I see you're raising your, your card. Go ahead, sir. Hi, Paige. A um, couple of questions. First of all, um, I, over the years, I've come to realize and understand it takes a lot of resources to take a, a, uh, an exam through OPES, and it takes a lot of time, and then to validate the exam and then to implement it. The second piece is that what is, how do we determine the drive for this particular exam, the, the uh, CRTDS? Is it valid to examine how many people are coming from those other states to California to see what the market drive might be? And if it doesn't have a significant number, why are we doing it? Maybe to staff, go ahead. All right. Would you, Would you like me to speak to that? you want to speak to that, Tracy? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to speak to it. So um, typically, we look at these exams again when, or these programs, when the board sees a need. When, when your uh, students, your schools, associations, and so forth are saying, we, we see a need for this to be considered a pathway. That's usually what initiates this. Uh, if your current pathways are doing well, individuals are getting licensed, there's not necessarily a need just to take the time and resources to look into this. Now, in the future, uh, the board could ask OPS to get some initial data about usage before undertaking such a project. But we're not aware of any requests other than credits approaching the board. Um, so again, that's where we see this as a lower priority. Does that help? Yes. Yes. Ms. McKenzie? Um, I would like to make a motion for the board to defer any review of the um, CRTDS until at least our board staff is more fully, you know, up uh, you know, up at uh, the level it should be, and OPES has um, bandwidth as well. Could, could I make a suggestion relative to the motion relative of to course. parliamentary procedure? Yes. It would be a most bon You want to postpone the action on this yes, is what please. you're suggesting. Yes. So you might make it, the motion should be, I would suggest, uh, to postpone it to a later meeting. Postpone to a later meeting? And then what the yes. factors are will be to be determined by board. Okay. Yes. Thank you, uh, Ms. McKenzie, <laughs> for that motion. Uh, Dr. Chan? I'll second that. Second motion. the motion. Okay. Is there any discussion on the motion as it is to postpone till a later meeting, uh, and that's all. And then board will then figure out when. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tara. Yes, I see. Could you just clarify what is being postponed? Is it um, review of the credits, or is it uh, discussion on credits? Right now, it seems to me, as I look at it, we don't really have any. We have nothing doing to discuss it further to see whether we want to review it, and because that's going to take a certain amount of work. I think that was the gist of what I was hearing around the table. Yes, that's so, correct. I think no postpone action. all yeah. all work or discussion or action. No action. Yeah. Just take it and look at it again in the future to see if we have interest or, or reason to do that. Okay, so perhaps let's postpone the item itself. Yes, correct. Uh, I think that that was Dr. Feltzenfeld's yeah. correct. There, there, yes. There's there's yeah. not going to be any action on what's here. The action will be on whether we want to postpone. If we decide not to postpone it, then we'll we'll go ahead and figure out what to do with it today. Is there any other board discussion on on the motion to postpone this to a later later date, another meeting? All right. Seeing none, is there any in person uh, in person uh, public comment on this? Again, I'm seeing none. All right, board, uh, board moderator, would you please facilitate public comment for this and for public comments via WebEx?
Uh, this is the moderator. At the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. Um, and then it does look like we have a, um, a Raquel uh, Cobbler would like to uh, comment. I did promote um, both her and it was Dr. Sam uh, Jacoby up to panelists. So if they would like to answer any questions, um, they can uh, unmute themselves um, and make any comments. Just as a matter of course, all we can hear is the comment. We cannot engage in conversation in public comment sessions. So let me know questions that can be answered by us. But go ahead, uh, whoever's first. Um, and this is the moderator of uh, Raquel. I see that your microphone is unmuted, but I don't hear any audio. Um, we had issues with her earlier in the day when we asked for public comment. I think there she is. Go ahead. Can you hear him? Can you hear him? You're both in the you're both in the same room. You're both in the same room. I suspect uh, one of you has to turn off whatever you're talking on. Yeah. Uh, no, one of you may need to turn off um, the sound. It looks like your microphone is, or it sounds like your uh, microphone is picking up on your microphone or your headset. <laughs> Can you hear us now? Yes, yeah. and no echo. <laughs> I apologize. Um, it's a little bit different setup than we're used to. Um, I, this is Rochelle Cobbler, the executive director of credits, and I do appreciate the uh, at least per, per I'm sorry, I appreciate you not making a vote today when you maybe don't have all the facts that we would appreciate you getting. Um, I want to remind the board that California is an outlier. Credits is accepted in 41 of the 48 states that accept licensure toward, uh, accept examination toward licensure. And we just, with all due respect, I, I understand how busy offices get. And I think that um, we would encourage the board to do it as the, as, as the right thing to do for candidates. You mentioned that there may not be a market for another exam. And the thing is, uh, there needs to be a market for an exam. A monopoly is a terrible thing in any industry, and we are dangerously moving toward that. We do have candidates who are taking the credits exam, uh, and, and we do have calls daily of those who want to because of various things that the credits exam offers that other agencies do not offer. Also in California, you have accepted the credits dental hygiene examination for, for numbers a number of years. And so it is uh, a little perplexing to us that the exam that we give is not accepted based on the components of the exam being substantially equivalent to other exams that you do accept. Uh, so that is a concern that we have. We think that, you know, um, there is a room for competition and there is a good desire for competition by the candidates. And we need to have more than one testing agency out there, which we do have. And California, again, is an outlier. So we just encourage you to assess our examination on the components being equally or substantially equal to the other examination and allow candidates to choose the examination they take based on the offerings. And Dr. Jacoby, our president, is here with me as well. Do I have time to say a few words? You have two minutes, sir. Okay, uh, just, just to give you a little background on, on credits and ADEX, ADEX was uh, originally organized a combination of REB, NERB, and credits, and actually uh, 
credits played a, a major part in the development of the ADEX exam. In fact, ADEX was uh, formed and uh, incorporated in Kansas where, where credits is. When the ADEX, the work for the ADEX exam was completed, um, part of the credits governance is that we have a number of member states and those member states, which number 23 now, which is almost half the nation, um, each state has both a steering member and members of our dental and dental hygiene exam review committees, which develop the exams as voting members and they participate in the development of the exam. And after the ADEX work was completed, um, our member states voted not to join ADEX because they would lose their ability to have representation at the table in terms of uh, development. So we are basically uh, test the same types of things. We have a little different viewpoint on now with simulation um, being accepted almost universally. 30 seconds. We have uh, we have a uh, difference of how that should be. The exam should uh, be conducted with the uh, as far as the carries. Uh, we have we feel like there's an opportunity for a level playing field of all the candidates, and so we do not have the variance in depth of decay, and that could be explained more at uh, another opportunity if we would have another opportunity to present. We'd appreciate that. Thank you. Are there any questions for us? Can't can't do questions, sir. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Kobler and uh, Dr. Jacoby. Uh, are there any other public comments uh, from the, the people on WebEx? This is the moderator. It appears there are no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q and A panel? Thank you. Please do. I think we're. I think we're ready to take the vote, uh, Dr. Yu. The, vo the motion is to postpone this for consideration at a later meeting. Okay, the motion is to postpone agenda item 9B and C update on Department of Consumer Affairs Office of Professional Examination, Service Acceptance of Dental Licensing Examination, and discussion and possible action regarding the Central Regional Dental Testing Service, Inc. Dental Examination as a Pathway to no, that, that to the is, future. excuse me, the, the motion will be, and forgive me, the motion is to postpone consideration of the credits to a later meeting. That, yes. That's all. That to was the, the old motion, and the motion supersedes that by Dr. McKenzie. Yes, postpone so, to the future. That's, that's yes. to a future meeting. That's what we're voting on. Go ahead, sir. Okay, take, take let's the take the, the roll now. Chen? Chen, I. Chen, I. Felsenfeld. Felsenfeld, I. Felsenfeld, I. Fort? Absent. Lorraine? Aye. Lorraine, aye. Mackenzie? Mackenzie, yes. Mackenzie, yes. Medina? Medina, aye. Medina, aye. Molina? Molina, absent. Morrow? Morrow, aye. Morrow, aye. Olagi? Olagi, yes. Olagi, yes. Pacheco? Pacheco, aye. Pacheco, aye. And you, aye. We have a quorum. We have a motion passed. <laughs> Thank you. We have both. Uh, Dr. Lorraine, did you have something you wanted to comment on? Yes, before we leave this agenda item, can I ask a question? You certainly can. Okay, here it says that OPES recommended, recommended examination specific, uh, well, they recommended the first thing to review is the IMBDE examination first because it's currently required as licensure. Now, my question is because this, uh, the dental board part two expired in August 1st, so if anybody takes the uh, integrated exam in August and, uh, and passes the uh, ADEX REB whenever at September, I mean uh, November, December, will they have to wait until OPES has reviewed this, or, or will they be able to uh, to get their uh, apply for the, the license? No, they will continue to be able to get licensed. So this is just an ongoing process that's done about every five years or so. But yes, licensees will still be accepted. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
All right. Uh, we good to go? All right. Well, thank you very much for all of that. Uh, Ms. Regali, I think you're still with us on item number 10A. Review of dental licensure and permit statistics. Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Felsenfeld. So I will also be presenting agenda item 10A, um, which begins on page 50 of the meeting materials and is a review of the dental licensure and permit statistics. Um, the memo is an overview of the dental license application statistics, the dental law and ethics written examination statistics, and the dental license and permit statistics. It also provides an overview of current and active, current and inactive, delinquent and canceled licenses. Page 65 of your meeting materials indicates the last occupational analysis done by the Office of Professional Examination Services um, was in 2018, with the target date for the next occupational analysis being in 2025. Moving on to page 68 of your meeting materials, the table provides statistics on dental license and permit statuses by fiscal year and continues to show current and active dental licenses by county and the population per dental license from fiscal year 2019 through June 30th of 2022. Yuba County has the highest population per dentist and San Francisco County has the lowest population per dentist. There is no action requested on this agenda item. I'm here for any questions if you have any, otherwise that concludes my presentation. Is there any board discussion on this report? I have something I would like to add then uh, if no one wants to preempt me. Uh, full disclosure, I uh, was one of the people that was involved from the CBA in the development of the portfolio examination, which we are looking at this year again. And yet we don't have any data on the portfolio examination. Uh, maybe it's because in the last three years we've issued none, and that may be the case, but I would sort of like to see some continuing data. We have eliminated it, and it, that's hurtful. I'm really hurt. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think it, it is a method of licensure, and I think we need to put that in. Okay. So just it just picks the table. That's all I'm asking. Yes, definitely. Okay. And we do present on the application statistics for portfolio. Um, however, as you yeah. mentioned, it just, is um, just to get a sense. I mean, I know the numbers are very low, but yeah. we're going to look at that. Okay. Any other board comments on this report? Are there any in-person public comments on this report? I'm sorry, Dr. Lorenz, sorry about that. You're down at the end. Hi, hi again, thank you. Do we have any statistics on how long it takes to uh, receive a license from the time they apply to the time it's provided? I know we're, we're very busy, um, as uh, Dr. Montes mentioned that at the office, but that's one of the major issues that's going on right now, that it's taking too long to apply. I mean, maybe not now, but in the future, could we hold, have some statistics on how long it takes? I, so, think, uh, I can think, answer. I think Tracy wants to jump in. Do you want to speak to it, or both I, of you? I can, yes. Okay, good. Um, so, typically, we don't present on statistics of um, processing time frames um, just because um, they are ever-changing. So, currently, um, right now, I can advise you that we are processing um, within mid to late July um, of applications and documents received. Um, we have had kind of a delay in processing, and it's been a little bit longer than in past years. Um, however, we are working diligently and kind of having, as Tracy mentioned, support come in from the department to help alleviate um, that processing delay and um, attempt to get everyone in the workforce as quick, quickly as possible. So approximately right how now? Right now, uh, approximately four to six weeks for processing applications and documents. Oh, really? No, no, I've heard of people months. So um, just not too long ago, it was um, probably about eight weeks. Um, however, we have um, taken some um, or, or made some changes um, with the processing um, and added staff. I myself have jumped in and have been processing applications as well as the other managers. Um, so we definitely have attempted to kind of um, bridge the gap for the processing time. right now uh, a little bit longer? Normally we always stay about four to six weeks. Right now we're right within that time frame again. Yes, I'd like to also add too that it's important that we clarify that that time frame means that it is a complete application package with no deficiencies where we're, the board seems to be running into challenges is when applications are received that have deficiencies because then a letter has to go out, the individual receives it, has to address the deficiencies 
send the letter and any materials back to the board that sits in a hopper because things are responded to by time. And so we will be posting processing times in the future as well as working on a campaign to help educate students, schools, stakeholders about the importance of submitting an entire package. Um, and that will definitely expedite processing. So I just wanted to elaborate. We, again, are going to work with the department's communications team. And again, thank Paige and her group for really stepping up and processing. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Regali. I think we're good. We're going to move on to 10B, and then we will take a break after this. Uh, Jessica Olney is going to present on agenda item number 10B, which is a presentation from the Department of Healthcare Access and Information. Good morning or good afternoon, Ms. Olney. And we have, we have people joining us on WebEx as well, is that correct? Okay, thank you. And that would be Ross Lallian. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Fosenfeld, and good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Jessica Olney, and I'm the anesthesia unit manager at the dental board, and I'll be presenting agenda item number 10B. To provide a brief background, Assembly Bill 269 added Business and Professions Code 1715.5, which is available on page 74 of your meeting materials. And this requires that the board collect data from all licensees at the time of renewal. Examples of the data collected include completion of an advanced education program accredited by the ADA, practice or employment status, and voluntary information on the licensee's cultural background and foreign language proficiency. A dental workforce survey was created which captures the survey data when a licensee renews utilizing the BREEZE system, and the information is compiled and posted to the board's website annually. Board staff have found that some of the data collected may not be accurate as many non-dentists indicate that they have completed at least five years or more of advanced educational training in a specialty recognized by the ADA. And those are uh, typically resi excuse me, residency courses which are taken by dentists. On July 1st, 20, 2022, Assembly Bill 133 became effective which renames the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development to the Department of Healthcare Access and Information, as we refer to as HCI, and requires healing arts boards licensed under the Department of Consumer Affairs to collect workforce data from healthcare workers. The BREEZE system was reconfigured and the HCI survey was launched on July 13, 2022. With the introduction of the HCI survey, many of the data points collected, which are shown on page 72 of your meeting materials, are duplicative and may not be necessary to collect separately. Board staff would like to request that HCI review the existing laws and data collected to provide the board with a recommendation on what can be updated to reduce errors and co uh, collect reliable data. I would like to introduce Ross Lallian, Healthcare Workforce Development Research and Evaluation Chief for the Department of Healthcare Access and Information, who will now provide a presentation. Thank you, Jessica. I hope everyone could, could hear me okay? We can, sir. Good, good. Thank you to the, the board for your time today. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ross Lallian. I'm the Research and Evaluation Section Chief in the Healthcare Workforce Development Division at uh, HCI. And my, presenta my presentation today will center around health workforce data collection and the introduction of our Health Workforce Research Data Center. Um, I don't think I can control the slides here. Can someone go to the next slide, please? Thank you so much. The topics I'll present on include an introduction to that Health Workforce Research Data Center and some of our data sources. I also want to share some use cases with you and how we can utilize some of this workforce data. Finally, I want to save plenty of time at the end, plenty of time at the end of the presentation to gather your feedback. Um, so we've developed a, a Q&A slide towards the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. Thank you. So to begin, I want to pro provide some background on this research data center. The center was created as part of a recast my organization went through recently. Uh, back in October of 2021, we used to be the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, or OSHPOD. We're now the Department of Healthcare Access and Information, or HCI. So as we graduated from an office to a department, strengthening our, our data assets was a priority. In the health workforce space, this was critical because our state schools lacked the central source for health workforce data. Without this centralized source, health workforce analysis is cumbersome, it's challenging, and at times it kind of limits the analysis we can actually conduct. 
And that's because health workforce data assets are housed all over the place in many different sources. To gather those data, that's a challenge. Then to prepare data sets from different data sources that are collected differently um, for, for meaningful analysis, understand limitations, assumptions, that's also challenging. So the research data center is created to solve this problem. The center is gonna serve as a centralized source for health workforce data. Uh, this includes data on the supply of the workforce, the demand of the workforce, and these states educational capacity to produce the health workforce in the future. The scope of the research data center includes all health workforce disciplines. It's a pretty large scope. So we're currently working hard on identifying appropriate data suppliers, stakeholders, kind of strategizing how best to measure things like demand of the workforce for many of these disciplines. And as part of the statute, the center is tasked with developing an annual, an annual report to legislature, which describes some of our, our priorities. So we're gonna report on education and um, employment trends. So understanding the educational pipeline, that's really critical for us. Also, there's a projection component to our analysis. So we wanna be informed about current workforce issues, but also uh, we'd like to understand what the workforce is projected to be in, in, the, in future years, which also may provide some key policy insights. Um, understanding supply and demand is critical. Uh, this includes a sheer volume of the workforce, but also the diversity of our health workforce. A priority for HCI is promoting a culturally concordant and responsive workforce for California. And it, to develop policy with this goal in mind, we need to be informed about the racial and ethnic makeup of the workforce, linguistic capacity, along with other key demographic data. Last point I wanna make here is that we're collecting these data to conduct this important analysis to inform our stakeholders, our partners, you all, but also to inform state health workforce policy. So HK is kind of in this unique situation where we're gonna have access to this robust database. I mean, it's gonna be an important input for internal program policy, but also for larger state policy issues as well with an end goal of targeting resources with as much accuracy as possible. Next slide, please. So I wanna take a couple moments here to discuss a couple of different sources of data that the research data center will be utilizing. In particular, I think it's important to note that the center has statutory authority to collect administrative data. Ad administrative data are those data that's collected through the administrative process of a program. On the next slide, I'll just describe a couple examples of administrative data. But the authority to collect these types of data really adds value to the center. Working with partners on a data collection tool during an application process, for example, that can really lead to um, improvements in, in data quality and response rates. I think our health workforce licensure data collection tool, which I'm gonna describe here in, in a few moments, that's really an example of administrative data. So administrative data, that's quite a bit different than conducting an ad hoc survey, for example. I think surveys are really important as well that could add value to the center, especially when we lack that administrative data. So we're gonna leverage surveys as well to the workforce, employers, stakeholders as necessary. And there's also valuable public data sources that we will leverage as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the research data center statute prescribes us to work directly with the employment development department, state licensing boards, and state higher education entities to collect workforce related data. And the types of data we're prescribed to collect include the supply and, the de supply and demand of the workforce, geographical distribution of the workforce, diversity of the workforce, and the educational capacity of the workforce. And our authority to really collect this high quality of administrative data puts us in that unique situation because we're able to manage these data and kind of structure these data to link and integrate and interact with each other, along with other data sources as well. So ensuring we collect high quality data is kind of fundamental to the work that, that we're gonna be doing and the statutory authority really enables us to collect high quality data. So the, the really critical supply side, supply side data set for the center is our state licensing board data. And I wanna go into a bit of detail in this data collection effort. So HCARI partnered with the Department of Consumer Affairs or DCA on this effort and DCA oversees 19 healing arts boards, dental board obviously being, being one of those, who manage the licensing process for many types of health practitioners in California. As part of the licensure renewal application process, which typically takes place every two years, HCI has worked with DCA to implement a workforce data collection tool. We're really excited about this great opportunity because it allows us to collect a robust set of data. Practitioners have to renew their license every two years, so we have their attention. And they have, they have the opportunity to submit these really important data to HCI on a regular basis. Then business and professions code 502 prescribes the data elements we may ask for during this process. Much of the, the data we're collecting is based on the health of resources, services the administration or HRSA's minimum data set. So HRSA recommends a baseline set of data to collect from all providers. And this serves as a really important starting point for us to be able to make comparisons statewide, but also on the national level. And so some of the variables we're asking for are listed here on the slide. However, this is not an exhaustive list, but just based on this limited list, you can uh, to see how valuable it will be to collect these data 
from a wide range of health providers throughout the state. So this data collection tool went live last month, really excited about it. The data is all voluntary. So the providers are gonna see every question during the licensure renewal process. However, they're gonna have a decline of state type of option, but to collect the highest quality data we could and aim for a really high response rate, we made it a priority to design the data collection tool in a manner which fosters that high response rate. So we're thoughtful in the order of the questions, response options, really thinking through what data, is, uh, what data we could roll over in succeeding years to make it easier for the licensee. We also partnered with and continue to partner with DCA and the marketing and communi uh, communications effort. DCA has been a really awesome partner on this. And the purpose of this communication effort is to inform licensees and boards about why this data collections effort is important and what's in it for them. And I think this is a very important piece to this process because we want the boards and licensees to understand why we're asking for all this data. I'm gonna transition us a bit to some of our data use cases, which are based on some of our historic data. I have several, I'll, I'll kind of go through them pretty quickly. Um, so these, these next few slides are examples of how we can utilize our current data, but also serves as a starting point as we think about how we really take our analysis to the next level. This is a pretty straightforward slide. This displays some of the professions we track and measure on ethnicity. This is not an exhaustive list of professions we collect data on. Simple visual that has a bar for the state population. That's a gray bar there. This adds some context. And a takeaway here might be that as the educational pathway for a profession increases in length and in cost, we see less Hispanic representation just as you move up that chart. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is an example of measuring diversity of the workforce and adding a representation index for context. So the way to interpret this is that if every racial and ethnic category was at one, um, which is represented by that gray vertical line there, that would, that would be absolute racial concordance. In, in, uh, and what that means is that the workforce aligns with representation in the state population. In this example, we're looking at dentists. Um, so the visual shows that there is both over and underrepresentation by racial category for dentists in California. This thinking about future analysis coming out of the center, I think conducting this analysis at a regional level would be even more insightful. Next slide, please. The next slide that's coming up here, this is another example of how we may track diversity as well. Um, this is gonna be data on physicians. I think we lost it there. This is a moderator. Um, one moment, we're having sure. technical difficulty because it looks like um, the rest of the slides are not there. So ah, okay. Me, <laughs> that solves the issue. Um, give me one moment. I'm going to see if I can re-upload the PowerPoint. Sure, um, sure. It might be something that WebEx did. <laughs> okay. Um, can we open up for questions while we're waiting? Is that appropriate? or? If you if you feel that you're done, Mr. Lallian, uh we can we can stop and go for board questions. If there's more that you know that's on the slides, we can wait a few moments. Or if you can summarize what's on the slides without the slides, that would be sure. good too. Either way, what what works for you, sir? Um, so the, the rest of the slides were this different data use cases. So different examples how we could use this data. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's different examples. They're mostly with with physician data, and this is a function of our his, the quality of our historic data. So I, I don't know if it's critical. Um, what I do want to kind of hear from you guys is that uh, there's some overlapping statute. I think Jessica mentioned some of that. Um, there's some statute where the dental board is prescribed to collect certain data. I think we're collecting similar data. And, you know, with, for licensees, as, as is, it's, I think it's confusing right now because they go through the licensure renewal process and they get our workforce survey, HKI's workforce survey that asks about their race, ethnicity, and other demographic data. And then they see the, the dental board survey right after that. And it asked for very similar things. It asked for the race ethnicity again, and they're, they're like, "Hey, what's going on? You already, you already asked my race ethnicity." So um, it might be like there. I think there's a way that HKI could, could possibly help the, the dental board, and we'd love to be be able to provide some value to you all. All right. Why don't we take board comment on this at this point? Uh, anybody, Dr. Chan? I see Dr. Chan, and I see Dr. Chan. Go ahead, sir. I understand the background, and I, I was there in the background for the drive for mm -hmm. looking at the cultural and linguistic competence of practitioners. But as we fast forward and look at page 72 towards the discussion, given today's political sensitivities and privacy acts, and even though the information may be voluntary, 
A legitimate question to ask is, what does gender or gender identity, sexual orientation, and disability status have to do with the delivery of dentistry? Thanks, then, Dr. Chan. Um, so I'll take that question. It's a really good question. So the, uh, when the statute was was developed, it was taking a look at the entire health workforce, right? And I think this the word concordance is something that's came up in our world quite a bit. Is that we have the right kind of matching and representation in the workforce, kind of across the board for different populations. And so, you know, race ethnicity, I think, is the one that that's been, you know, we've talked about that for years, and it's critical to get folks that speak the same language as well. But something that that's coming up is, you know, folks from the LGBTQI community, their voice and their concerns about healthcare professionals not saying, hey, we're not represented in the health workforce. Um, and so, what we're doing with this research data center again, a voluntary basis. And before I move move forward, I just want to uh, just kind of emphasize. How how uh, how serious we take data privacy, where it's really kind of go go for that gold standard with data privacy. We don't at least data at the individual level at all, especially when it comes to gender identity, sexual orientation. But we're just trying to collect these data now, and it's kind of this uh, this emerging topic in the health workforce space in really understanding where there's those gaps in representation. Um, so that's what the, that data collection effort is for, and I hope that answers your your question. Um, unfortunately, it does not answer the question. The um... Employment laws come into play too. We can't ask those kinds of questions. When you say we, are you talking about the dental board? Employers cannot ask ask those questions of a prospective employee. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah. And so the Dr. Chan is to clarify this the licensure renewal process. So um, it's not the, the employer asking um, the, the question here. And we're not sharing this, these data with, with employees as well. I may have to defer this question to our attorney because it seems to be a landmine. Okay. Uh, one second, Joanne, did you want to speak or no? Okay, Do Dr. Chen, bear with us for a couple of seconds. Tracy would like to speak to this and then I've got a suggestion. So um, I just would like to share that um, although this topic doesn't come up as much, at least I haven't heard as much with the Dental Board of California. I know um, some of our other boards and bureaus at the department have very uh, have been interested in collecting information like this for quite some time. As you know, um, our governor is, uh, one of his um, missions is to address diversity, inclusion, and equity. And um, I believe that, that this is part of that. And so, with our department, we are actually prevented from collecting this type of information. We have a government code, so upon licensure, uh, we have to be very sensitive about information that we collect and, and haven't been able to do much of this. But with this new um, legislation, we can do it through the renewal process. So what we're trying to do, uh, if I understand it correctly, is collect a lot of information that can be used again to see whether or not our practitioners across the DCA are representative of those that we are helping. And we're doing this, attempting to do it, recognizing confidentiality, privacy, and so forth. And so that's why it's during, during, done during the renewal process, not upon licensure, and it's why the data goes outside of consumer affairs. Consumer affairs in this part with this um, information, we're not seeing this um, from our licensees. And again, it's just to help ensure that we are being uh, providing services and helping with regard to the workforce. So that's a little bit more of that. Again, we get this a lot with our Board of Behavioral Sciences, our Board of Psychology, again, wanting to collect this data and we have to explain no, we can't, we're prevented, but now we have this opportunity through a vehicle that recognizes privacy. And Jessica's and gonna add. Jessica, did you wanna add to that? I just wanted to extend on that. Um, in working with the Breeze team, they created a method to require the survey through your renewal, um, but we can only see that it's been completed. The only data that we see is that it was completed and the date that it was completed we don't have access to that data. It, it is sent directly, or the user is sent directly to HPI's website. 
some of this is a little duplicative as well for what we're asking and what they're asking and, and the like. Correct. Okay. Um, they are collecting data on where um, people are working, the hours that they are working. They're actually collecting more information. Um, I think the, you know, one of the questions that they ask is retirement. You know, okay. how soon do you plan on retiring? And that's something that we don't know for our licensees. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, is there any other board discussion on this? Um, I'm going to make a suggestion or I'm going to make a, a recommendation. We have on page uh, 73 of our, our, our document, uh, and it's an action that's requested. I'm going to make a motion that we direct staff to work with the Department of Healthcare Access and Information, HCI, to review business and profession codes section 1715.5 and the data collected to determine the value in continuing to collect the, board of dental, the board's dental workforce survey at the time of renewal to coordinate that is what I'm saying and provide recommendations on updating data points and or survey questions to collect reliable data. That is my motion. Is there a second? Pacheco, second. Dr. Pacheco, Ms. Pacheco, sorry. Uh, you can be a doctor. Uh, Ms. Pacheco is seconding it. Is there any board discussion on this? Seeing none, is there any in-person public comment? Did you want to speak? Come on up and talk to us. Turn it on there. Please. All right, it's on. Hello, I am Tuka Zokai with the California Dental Association. And um, just a comment about the categories for diversity, to, um, just seeing if they're an HCI standard and if they reflect the 2020 census categories, because the ones I saw listed seem to be somewhat um, outdated and not as inclusive of what a lot of new data is collecting with more specific categories. Um, so just something to consider. And this is an area that the California Dental Association and California Dental Association Foundation is also investigating. So um, it is part of the DEIB work group to investigate diversity in dentistry, specifically leadership and faculty. So um, just a note. Thank you. Is there any additional in-person public comment? Seeing none. I'm sorry, Dr. Morrow. Yeah, in, a, in this. In the microphone, please, Dr. Morrow. While we're collecting this data regarding access to care, I haven't heard any collection of data regarding uh, reasons why patients are not, do not have access to care. What are the reasons that they give for not being able to have dental care when they need it? Do we have data that supports that? Um, Go ahead. Did you want to speak, Ms. Welsh? It, we don't have um, statutory authority to collect that type of patient information. I, I would say that, you know, to the extent the enforcement unit could have some determination based upon the number of complaints they're getting or the information reported in the consumer complaints, you know, there's an idea of what's kind of going on, but unless uh, the board has specific statutory authority to collect some kind of survey or um, information from the public as to what's going on. We, we're not collecting it because it also creates this um, uh, additional obligation as to how the board maintains those records. So are, are they confidential? Are they releasable to you know the public under a PRA request? So. Um, we're, we're careful just to collect the information that we're authorized to collect, and then we're careful as to how we maintain it. So, yeah, perhaps a, um, maybe a CDA, uh, the, the Dental Association, could, you know, send out some kind of survey for their patients. You know, they could start having some kind of better understanding about what's going on, why, why patients don't return, or um, the financial burdens they're facing and maybe that's the cause, you know. Um, but right now I think we're, the board is just collecting the information that it's authorized to collect. And um, HCI is also doing the same thing, trying to have a better understanding of the um, 
workforce in the future? How diverse is the current workforce? What do we need to do to diversify in the future? How how many professionals do we need? You know, who's exiting the profession? Um, that's the information we've got right now. If I could make one comment about that, Dr. Morrow. Uh, in, in my former life, I was pretty active with CDA, as you as you probably know, uh, and we have a ton of data on why people don't go to the dentist or can't go to the dentist or won't, you know, won't go to the dentist. Uh, we've done a lot of studies on that back in the days when we did access to care stuff. So, so this is looking at the group of people who can put things out there. You're looking at the people who may want to be a part of the need. Two different things. Uh, I think we have to finish with this. There is data out there. They may need more, but there's something we can work with. Okay. All right. Is that would be important information for us to have from sure. the standpoint of what what is the problem that we can address? What, what is the from the patient's viewpoint? Why are they not being able to receive care when that, that's yes, that's the other part of the, of the public equation. Is our primary objective in being a board? That that's the other part of the equation. We here here's what we have, but why aren't you using us? That's what you're saying, and and that data does exist to a certain extent, and it may need refreshing. Is there any, just to be just to be clear, is there any other uh, in-person comment? We, I know we asked that once before. Seeing none, uh, there are public comments from individuals who are on WebEx. DCA moderator, please facilitate the lines for public comment. This is the moderator, and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. Please do that. All right, uh, Dr. Yu, would you like to read the motion? Sure. Uh, and then we'll take a vote on it. We okay there? You're looking at me like I need to say something, or are you looking for something? Are you okay? Oh, no, I'm good. Thank All right, you. All right, good. No, you're okay? I'm okay. Let's go, Dr. Okay. Yu. Okay. Let's the, keep talking. We have a break right about now. Okay, the motion is to direct staff to work with the Department of Healthcare Assets and Information to review business and profession code section 1715.5 and the data collected to determine the value in continuing to collect the board's dental workforce survey at the time of the renewal and provide recommendations on updating data points and or survey questions to collect reliable data. Okay, so now I'm gonna call the roll. Please do. Chen? Chen I. Chen I. Felsenfeld. Felsenfeld, aye. Felsenfeld, aye. Ford? Absent. Lorraine? Lorraine, aye. Lorraine, aye. Mackenzie? Mackenzie, yes. Mackenzie, yes. Medina? Medina, aye. Medina, aye. Molina? Absent. Morrow? Morrow, aye. Morrow, aye. Olagi? Olagi, yes. Olagi, yes. Pacheco? Pacheco, aye. Pacheco, aye, and you, aye. All right. motion passed. The motion has passed. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lallian, we're going to be looking to work with you a little more to clarify things as time goes on. Thank you for your presentation this morning. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jessica, Ms. Aldi. All right, it is uh, 10 after 3, 25 after 3. We'll resume. We're going to take a break for a bio break, or if you want to stay in a 97-degree heat, good luck to you. All right, we'll see you at 325. Welcome back. Thank you. We have a nice little break. Uh, we'll move on now to item 11A through J, update and discussion and possible action on proposed uh, regulations. We're going to ask David Bruggeman, uh, who's the legislative and regulatory specialist, to present this item. Good afternoon, Mr. Bruggeman. Good afternoon, President Felsenfeld and board members. Uh, as you indicated, I'm going to update the board on the status of the 12 rulemaking packages that are in various stages of development. There are two packages in particular that we'll have some extended board discussion of possible action on. Um, the, so basically, I'm going to be hitting the highlights of the materials that start on page 75 of your, of your meeting books. In terms of the following packages, um, it just brief updates in terms of their status. For the 
uh, package concerning the uh, changing the membership requirements for the Diversion Evaluation Committee. That package has been approved. Those regulations went into effect last fall. For the uh, change in the scoring criteria for the law and ethics exam for the for um, for dentists, that uh, has been approved as well. Those regulatory changes went into effect on July 1st of this year. The consolidated continuing education package, which concerned providing continuing education requirements for volunteer work, as well as addressing the ability to take continuing education credits related to drug addiction, that package has been filed with OAL. It was filed with the Office of Administrative Law on July 28th. They have 30 working days to review the package, which by my estimation indicates that we should receive an update by the middle of December, excuse me, by the middle of September in terms of their approval or request for additional action on that package. The next items, the telehealth notification package, package on the dental assisting comprehensive rulemaking, the radiographic decision making package, package on elective facial cosmetic surgery permits, uh, package on mobile and portable dental unit registration requirements, and the minimum standards for infection control. Those packages are still under development with staff, not in a position to bring them to the board at this time. Um, then we have the uh, regulations connected to the implementation of Senate Bill 501, the updates to the sedation and anesthesia permits. Um, at our last meeting, the board approved second modified text uh, by, from the request of the Office of Administrative Law. That material was noticed for 15 days. Comments were received. Those comments were deemed not to be connected to the specific changes that were put forward in the second modified text, so it was deemed that no response from the board was necessary. Though, so after that notice period, off the, the Office of Administrative Law has reviewed that material. They approved those regulations on August 17th, and those uh, regulations are now in effect. And, and operable people are actually doing it now? Yes. Uh, Jessica only can give the further there's another agenda item specific to the implementation of SB 501 for tomorrow. Uh, Jessica can go into further detail about the specifics in terms of the actions that she and her staff have taken on that point. Okay. So that's the, the brief update of the in progress or already approved packages, regulatory packages that the board is working on right now. There were two other items that require additional discussion. But before I get to those, are there any questions that for the board members have? It appears not, sir. All right. So I'm going to move on to the memo that is on page 82 of your board meeting packets. This concerns agenda item 11K. This is the rulemaking package to make permanent the emergency regulations that implement Senate, uh, Assembly Bill 526, which permits dentists to initiate and administer COVID-19 and influenza vaccines. So those emergency regulations have already been approved. They are in effect until February. There is a rulemaking package that the board has already granted staff approval to initiate concerning making those regulations permanent. During the conversations in, uh, uh, on our March meeting, and this is why we have the memo here in the book, there was some confusion over whether or not dentists would be allowed to administer these vaccines outside of their dental offices. And under further review, as described within the memo, is determined that they are not limited to uh, their office in terms of an uh, administration site for those vaccinations. This particular package, we have already filed the um, package, the regular rulemaking package with the Office of Administrative Law. It will be noticed or is scheduled to be noticed in the register on September 2nd. And so that's when the beginning of the rulemaking process starts. That will be the 45-day initial comment period where the public can provide their comments. And uh, at the November meeting, the comment period will have already be closed. If there are adverse comments, we will bring them to the board at that point. So we simply wanted to bring to the board's attention the clarification around that issue of the vaccine administration. We are not asking the board for any additional action on this package at this time. 
President Bowser's own. Dr. Morrow, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question, if you if you don't mind. Please. Regarding the vaccine yes. uh, administration by dentists, it is my understanding that this will also allow dental students under the supervision of a licensed faculty member at this school, that school of dentistry to also be able to administer vaccines. Do you have any information on that? Um, I do not have any information on that. I would be happy to research the specifics of that case and get back to you. I would appreciate it. Of course. One of the issues that came up during the pandemic was that uh, at my university, healthcare university, uh, nursing students, medical students, pharmacy students, under the supervision of their faculty, were able to administer vaccines in our university-based uh, vaccine center. However, dental students were not. So as a result of that, an appeal was made, and we got a waiver from the Department of Consumer Affairs to allow that to happen. Then my understanding is that this bill will make it such that in the future, should such pandemics occur again, hopefully not, that dental students will be able to join into that. On my university campus, there were 400 dental students that were unable to administer vaccines in our vaccine clinic when it would have been a tremendous advantage to the, to the public to be able to have a larger vaccine force. I understand that, and as I indicated, I will conduct some research on that issue and, and get back to the board. Appreciate it. Thank you. President Felsenfeld? Yes, sir. Do you want to have another question? I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Lorin. Thank you. Thank you for the information. I'm just curious to find out how we ended up with uh, with a one-hour training, because I, I know I uh, when I was a volunteer, I was vaccinating, and I had required to be able to vaccinate. It was about three hours training for the first time. I would think it's okay for the, you know, a re-registration one hour, but for the first time, there's a lot of information, storage and handling, transportation, uh, the, every vaccine with the content is all the different issues that go around the vaccination. So I just wondered how you, we ended up with one hour. So the development of these uh, regulations was uh, through the contributions of uh, existing work done by the California Department of Public Health. Um, if you're interested in changing the specifics of the requirements, that is certainly something that can be done through the regular rulemaking process. If later, you, later on, or when? It, so once the um, once the this package that I just referenced is published in the notice register the board will have the opportunity to amend the regulations. So um, at the November meeting, most likely, this would come up again to concern, to deal with any adverse comments that we may receive, and the board would have the opportunity to revise <coughs> the language of the regulations at that point. So the health department actually thought one hour was enough? You think so? It, I'm, it, the material, the <coughs> suggested language that we worked with was provided by them. Uh, the specific rationale that they have for that, I can't give you off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. We have another comment on this question. Ms. Shields, I believe you're on the WebEx. Can you hear me, and would you like to speak to this? Can you hear me? I can now. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, I thought I was. my phone was connected, but apparently it's not. So... In any event, I, I wanted to first address Dr. Morrow's question. The statute does not provide for any other healthcare provider other than a dentist to administer the vaccine. So the current statute and regulation only contemplates dentists having the authority to administer and initiate vaccine. If there may be situations where uh, in an emergency situation like a pandemic declaration emergency, where there can be application to the director to waive that requirement. Um, but in this situation, this particular statute and regulation only contemplates that dentists are authorized to prescribe and administer vaccine. So that's where we are with this particular statute. You know, if that's something that you're interested in exploring that on a permanent basis, that would be something we'd need a legislative uh, fix for, so to speak. 
The other issue with respect to public comment on the rulemaking, the prior motion from the March board meeting was that if no adverse comments were received, that we would complete the rulemaking. So my question to the board is, do you want us to bring the package back to you whether or not we get an adverse comment in the November board meeting? If, if I might restate the question, does the board anticipate having a need to amend the text absent the presence of an adverse comment, which would require a board response? So I can give you a little bit more background on the one hour requirement. That was something we were, when we were uh, consulting with the Department of Public Health, we discussed. We also discussed it with your prior executive officer and it was her suggestion that we stay with the one hour because you are the dentist and the rationale we've given is the dentists already are quite familiar with how to administer vaccine given the history of where this reg, uh, statute and regulation uh, originated. And so we, the, the feeling was, and the rationale was that one hour was sufficient. But if you, upon reconsideration, don't believe it is, then we would need a motion from this board to bring the uh, text back for consideration after the close of the public comment period, regardless of whether there is an adverse comment or not. Dr. Chan? Thank you, Michelle. Don't go away. I was also on our vaccination team, and there are many, many moving parts to this. And realize, well, first of all, realize what I'm saying is in the context of early 2021 and things evolve, information evolves. What we knew back then evolves from where we are now. So the first thing that comes to question is, um, it says for the dentist to authorize, to prescribe and administer, how long do we have to keep the records for that first thing? Number two, it talks about um, record keeping for the Department of Public Health, um, but there also is record keeping with the manufacturer with the materials. Um, for example, with Pfizer, there's a digital record with the shipment from the time it leaves the warehouse to the time it arrives at the hospital, time that it takes to defrost, time that it takes to mix. There's a lot of different steps with that. And if it's not followed, who is liable for that, for the vaccine not to have worked? The third thing is with the C, I agree with um, Dr. Laren about the one hour where the initial, this is back in 2021, was three hours, and it was a CDC approved one. So the secondary question with the dental board then is, how do we approve CE credit from CDC. The third thing is um, when, when the administration of the vaccine is done not within one's own office, but let's say at a public event, it doesn't necessarily describe who has to keep the records because we're the ones that are administering, but we're also prescribing it. The last piece has to do with some of the dark side that came out where it may be something that we might consider as unprofessional conduct to forge or to lose or to have um, missing vaccination cards um, because that does happen too. Thank you. Okay, where are we going with this? Sure, good. The other subtext also was that so, there is special considerations for consent for minors when you administer for minors. So, may I, Dr. Please, please do. Yes, go ahead, Michelle. Okay, there, there was a lot in there, so please let me know if I missed anything. 
But 1625.6, the scope of 1625.6 is to set um, basic immunization training requirements. And they're your requirements. They're not CDC requirements. The continuing education is your is your requirement, not CDC's. We consulted with them in the development of the regulations because they're the state agency for responsible for immunization compliance and compliance with federal law and the rollout, so to speak, in California. So they're the the point agency for that type of healthcare issue. And so we consulted with them uh, about how to do that because part of the statute also is to set standards for record keeping and reporting requirements, which we've done here in this regulation, and the reporting requirements to the immunization branch of the State Department of Public Health. We've also done that here in this regulation. So that was our scope. Anything beyond that is already covered by state and federal law, and it's something we don't administer here, what we were supposed to do with these regulations and the task that was given to us was to set forth minimum training requirements, CE, record keeping and reporting requirements. And so if you look at the text that you approved in March, uh, we have the material at subdivisions B through F, which sets forth the requirements and the documentation that you have to retain. So certificates of completion for training and also the requirements uh, for personal vaccination information and the patient record information that is supposed to be maintained. As far as the other requirements that we don't administer, that would be on the dentist to, to determine in order that in order to comply with those federal and state agency requirements. But what we enforce is what we have here in front of you. And the documentation does need to be retained by the dentist according to 10, 1017 of the of the board's current regulations. Um, and it's three years that we put in there. That's consistent with your current requirements. And so the CE requirements are for continuing education units are in 1017, and it, this regulation proposal is consistent with those requirements. So I don't know if there was anything else that you, I'm sorry, there was a lot. I am not sure if I got all of your questions, but was there anything else? It's Dr. Felsenfeld. Let me let me ask. I'd like to sort of bring this around to some kind of a place where we can make a decision about what to do. As I understand what you're suggesting, at least from this last little uh, discussion, is that if we do nothing and accept this as informational that it's progressing along and we don't take any action on it, it's going to continue to progress along and will eventually be made rules, hopefully the way they are as we've done in the as we've approved in the past. Am I correct with that? All right. Correct. If we elect to change anything, then we're going to have to go back and redo rulemaking and possibly statute and prolong the process by as long as that's going to take. Is that correct? Depending on what kind of changes you want to make. Okay. I mean, if it's just within the scope of what 1625.6, as I just read to you, if it's within that scope, then we would just need to change the text, and we could do that after the public comment period closes, Okay. which would be – probably, I think it's October 18th. So after October 18th, we could bring it back to you for further review to see if you want to make any changes. That would text. make some sense to me. That would make some sense to me. Uh, we were happy with this at one point, yes? Yes. So if we wait, we all, we'll have another shot at it, so to speak, if in fact public comment comes in and there's anything disparaging or changing, we can look at that again. Or if it comes in with no adverse comments, we can just let it go and and proceed forward, if I'm not mistaken. Am I getting that correct that's again? The, that's the current motion that you okay. that we're operating under. The current motion is we only bring it back if we receive adverse comments. So the question is, do you want me to ask the staff to bring it back regardless of whether you get adverse comments? And that would be your decision point today. All right. Well, anybody have any thoughts? Dr. Dr. Yu, yes, sir. Yeah, I just have a user that's... Uh, Mike, Mike. 
得係咪 issue？ 新 patient 未到咯，咁 strong side effect during administration of the vaccine， and some of the side effect could be a life threatening。So what is our duty of and responsibility as a dentist who administer the vaccine？ Anybody want to speak to that?、Uh, you know, it, it, in reality, it's not anything... currently. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you, you speak. So, the current regulatory proposal does not address professional standards when it comes to administration of vaccine in terms of, you know, what to do and and how to、uh, evaluate a patient's condition. That's something that would be dealt with.、Um, And, and another agenda item, at the very least, this is, this regulatory proposal is simply doing what we've been asked by the legislature to do, which is set forth the standards for、uh, the training, the record keeping, and the reporting requirements, so that the immunizations can occur. Similarly, like we have other types of、um, you, you inject other types of drugs, right? Into patients, but we don't have a regulation that prescribes how that occurs. That's something that happens within within the professional standards, right? That unprofessional conduct, you have to comply with the standards of the profession. And so we would expect the dentist to know what they are because that's the training you receive in dental school: how to inject things, how to deal with patients that have allergic reactions, whether it's a vaccine or some other drug. Novocaine, right? So we don't prescribe that kind of thing in regulation typically. So I don't see a need to do that here, even if we had、uh, a requirement to do it according to the legislature. That would be my suggestion. But this particular proposal is only intending to address what the legislature tasked you to do to implement this program, which, in their view, was simply setting forth the. Immunization training, record keeping, CE, and reporting requirements necessary to allow this to occur. Does that make sense? Well, I think eventually someone who administered the vaccine will run into this issue. That, say, for some, for example, my one of my patients, she was sick for two months after the vaccination, and then、uh, almost lost her life. So whoever who who in charge of that,、uh, does he going to carry responsibility, or or because it is it is the because of the emergency use from the FDA, so the、uh, the dentist won't have the responsibility. Well, we can certainly think about putting a future agenda item on there for you know to discuss issues related to vaccine administration and unprofessional standards in administration. If that's what the board would like to do to discuss that, what the concerns are, and whether the profession is adequately prepared to know, for instance, to refer to a medical doctor or other professional if there's an adverse reaction, something like that. But I don't think that this regulation is actually that time, in my opinion, because we this regulation is simply how to initiate and administer the vaccine, not. Aftercare and other issues that may be related to vaccine administration. So my recommendation, I'll defer to board counsel, would be to put that as a future agenda item if you'd like to discuss that. But I don't believe it needs to be addressed in this regulatory proposal. That would be my suggestion. We're, we're getting a lot of head nodding. Yes, that's correct. We're gonna we will do that for the future. Look at it for the future. Uh, I'd like to sort of get this to some place where we can move on because we're going a little bit in circles. I'm going to make a suggestion, and Ms. Sledge, tell me if it, I'm going to make a, a motion, which I think will maybe paraphrase what you were suggesting. That at this point, we feel that we have made whatever decisions we have to make on this regulatory package, and we'd like to see it progress along. If there are adverse comments. Then I think we have an obligation to look at them, as we do with adverse comments on anything we do. And if there are not, we can let it continue to go. That's that's a motion that I'm making, just to see if we can. And 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 with the understanding that if we want to make changes, then it's going to get into a, a a longer term inability to do what we would like to do. And remember one other thing about this:、uh, it's elective. You don't have to give any of these if you don't want to. If you're not comfortable.、Uh, Tara, did you want to speak, Ms. Welsh? 
I'm, I'm sure Christy would probably um, clarify this, but the board has already moved and adopted a motion to bring so, the proposal back if there are oh, adverse comments. So, so, so that's where we were on the last motion, last time. Right. In the, okay. When the emergency regulations were approved, that was the that was it. of the motion. Then we have nothing we have to do except move on to the next item of business if that's what we would like to do. If anyone wants to you know, maybe delay the process or change things, then we're going to have to take that up. Does anyone want to do that now that I put it in such great positive words? <laughs> I, I have a feeling. All right. Uh, is there anyone who wants to take that on and, and suggest some? Uh, the power of the chair. Okay. We, <laughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Bergman. There's a lot going on here, a lot of moving parts. You're absolutely correct, Dr. Chan. And it is elective. You do not have to give <laughs> You have to give uh, lidocaine, uh, Ms. Fledge, not novocaine. But all right, go ahead. Uh, all right. Keep going. Keep, no, keep going, David. That's quite all right. So Thank I'm you for the correction, to... Dr. Valsenfeld. <laughs> it's what I'm all about. I'm going to move on to agenda item 11L, which is the discussion of possible action to initiate or rule make and adopt proposed uh, California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section 1006. You can find this on page 89 of your meeting materials or the start of the memo. Um, AB 107 is legislation that was passed into law and signed by the governor last fall, and would be the relevant section of that law affects. Um, it comes into effect in July 1 of 2023, and so the the memo outlines the proposed rulemaking that we want to initiate now in order to meet the date of enactment of the of the language here, and what the law would do would be to provide for qualified spouses or domestic partners of military service members who have been stationed in California to obtain temporary licensure for whatever profession they have been licensed in the previous, at the location or the previous posting. So for, if in, in our situation, for the board situation, if there's the spouse of a military service member who is a licensed dentist, uh, the spouse, the military spouse is transferred to California, the the law would provide the um, qualified dentist to submit an application for temporary licensure, which would allow them to practice while the regular license process is uh, taking place. Such temporary licensure would only be good for 12 months and could be revoked if on a review of the application or of the background check that would be requested that there were grounds for uh, denial of licensure that would be consistent with existing laws and regulations related to that. So what we have done here is to, uh, starting on page 91, outline a proposed section 1006, which it describes the process and defines relevant terms for these temporary licenses. And the the board the board staff is essentially going to ask the board to review this proposed regulatory text and whether you support it as written. We have a motion A in our memo on page A, uh, on page 90. If you have changes that you would like to suggest, we have a motion B on page 90 that would be suggested motion language at, at this point. So the, the the section 1006 as I said before, simply uh, defines relevant terms and outlines the process by which uh, an applicant would achieve temporary licensure through the dental board. And because we're focusing on licenses, this would be for dentists, this would be for uh, registered dental assistants. So at this point, I'd like to see if there are any questions from hey, board Moral. members. Yeah, Just, Moral. <clears throat> Just pointed out, uh, under uh, section 1006A1, uh, uh, the word revoked is repeated twice. That's in our, is that, is that in our uh, preliminary text? Or are you talking in the actual? No, I'm sorry. Revoked, removed. What is reproved? What does that mean? What does reproved mean? As, as I understand the language, it's another. Uh, indication that there is action taken against the the license for for, for misconduct. I don't know what reproval is, so um, if I may, it's a you, you can like the board can issue a public reproval which is like a, a slap in the hand. It's just a letter. It's not formal discipline. 
Um, it's and, usually called a, re, a, a reprimand in other statutes, but ours is called a reproval. Okay, got it. But it's considered discipline because it's a negative comment on your licensing record. We see this term sometimes in our uh, in our cases that we have to review for discipline. Well, I can reprove students now. You can <laughs> you can reprove whoever, you can reprove whoever you like, Dr. Morrow. <laughs> All right, so let's have some board discussion on which way we're going to go on this and or a motion on either of these two. If, if it's going to be on the second one, we have to suggest some changes. Otherwise, if we're happy with the language, then the first one will prevail and not be reproved. We'll see. Uh, do we have any discussion from the board on what we want to do? Seeing none, I'm going to assume that no one has any changes they want to suggest. Is that a reasonable thing? Anybody have anything they want to suggest in terms of changes to the existing language? At which point, someone could make motion A if you want your name in the record. <laughs> I move that we move forward with this. Uh, do you want to read motion A, or are you going to have Dr. You will read the whole thing at some point? Uh, so you're, you're making a. a recommendation that motion A Page are you on That's on page 90 of the uh, of the main program there. Towards the, the top of the page. Page 90. Yeah, page 90 of the. Uh, I will read it. Okay. Well, go ahead. So you're making this motion. Go ahead, Dr. Morrow. Approve the proposed regulatory text for section 1006, and submit the text to the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency so re for review, and if no adverse comments are received. Authorize the executive officer to take all steps necessary to initiate the rulemaking process. Make any non-substantive changes to the text and the package and set the matter for a hearing if requested. If after 45-day public comment period no adverse comments are received and no public hearing is requested, authorize the executive officer to take all steps necessary to complete the rulemaking and adopt the proposed regulations as described in the text notice for 16 CCR section 1006. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Uh, Morrow. Uh, Ms. Welsh. I've got a proposed tweak. What's that, please? I have a proposed revision. Oh, you do? I do. Well, okay. But now, from a parliamentary standpoint, this is on. You can still amend it. You want to make a motion to amend this by putting something in, as we're su suggesting? I'm, I'm sorry, you can't hear me, is that the point? I'm very loud, in general I'm very loud, I find that out. All right, so I think Ms. Welch would like to suggest an amendment to this resolution at, to take A and to make a change, or do you want to go to the original text, at which point we have to uh, not have a second on A, and we can let it die for lack of a second. If no one seconds it, then we can move on to what Ms. Welch would like to do. Well, right. but, kill my what's that? Yes. We're, okay. we're killing yeah, the answer. Okay. Yeah. Do, we, do we have a second? Do we have a second for the motion? No, you don't. You can't retract it. Do we have a second for the motion that's before us? Seeing none, we have nothing before us. Dr. Ms. Welsh, would you like to make some changes or suggest them? Make a re remove. We can okay. remove it. So, um, on the proposed language, uh, this is page 91 of the meeting materials. Proposed section 1006. Subsection A, paragraph one, it's the definition of disciplined. Right now it states means that the applicant's license is not on probation, et cetera. This kind of creates a double negative when you get over to um, what the applicant has to disclose on page 93 in paragraph five, the applicant shall disclose whether the applicant has been disciplined, but the definition is not disciplined. So I'm, I'm recommending that um, back to page 91, we change the definition of disciplined from means that the applicant's license is not on probation to we strike is not an insert has been placed. So it would read disciplined means that the applicant's license has been placed on probation, et cetera. So if someone is disciplined, they have all these things that they're Someone's told them they've been reproved, they've been slapped, they've been revoked. Yes. So, so discipline, you're making that a positive statement. Yeah, it, it would include probation, revocation, suspension, and anything. And that would be consistent yeah. with the language further down? 
Yeah, that okay. that would then make it uh, paragraph five on page 93 makes sense that the applicant shall disclose whether the applicant has been disciplined by a licensing entity. Okay. And then also and Dr. Felsenfeld, I agree with that change. Thank, there was a we Liz. shouldn't have put a not in there. Shouldn't have been a yeah, not. That, I in think that that's probably a typo, sentence. actually. Yeah. Um, so then I would just note that um, this this regulation implements Business and Professions Code Section 115.6, um, which is authorizing the board to issue um, an expedited license, effectively. Uh, it's a temporary license. Um, however, in section 115.6, subdivision C5, it says that the applicant seeking a temporary license under this section shall meet the following requirements. In C5, it says the applicant shall not have been disciplined by a licensing entity. So even though in 1006 we're defining discipline as has been placed on probation, and the applicant on page 93 has to disclose whether they've been disciplined, then the statute itself says if they've been disciplined and this regulation allows us to get those records, then they would not qualify for the temporary license. I just want to close the loop on that, link it all up. If they've had a bad, a bad, a bad position in the past in another state, then we cannot give them a temporary license. What Correct. What you're suggesting by that. And we're changing the A to discipline means you've been You've been told something is wrong and something is, is not good for the way you're practicing or whatever. Okay. So do we have only the one change and it would be consistent with what the second was? All right. So you want to amend this text by striking out the the word uh, is not on. Uh, is not. Strike is not from that first line in section 1006, subsection A, paragraph. No, it, it doesn't read. You have to leave is in there, but not discipline. No. Not, not on probation. Is on probation? No. Um, it would read applicant's license has been placed okay. on. Okay. Has been on probation then. Changing those two words to the other two. Has been placed on probation. Has been placed on probation. So line one under A. Uh, the applicant's license has been placed on probation, revoked, suspended, whatever. Okay, that's the that's the amendment you're suggesting. Uh, we can actually vote to make this the amendment, and then we can vote to take this in the motion B as amended. That will work. That'll do everything we need to do. So, is there any discussion on the amendment? Uh, that's been moved. Uh, well, I, I'll move it. Uh, yeah, and then Steve, you, you just you just seconded it. Thank you, Felsenfeld and Chan on the amendment. All right, um, so the amendment is before us. Is there any discussion on the amendment? All right, I guess we have to call for in-person comment on the amendment. Now, what's that? The, the, well, not the whole motion, just the amendment first. And then we're going to vote on the whole motion. All right, then we have to go to the WebEx, uh, WebEx and people, whoever's uh, in public comment. I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Wilson. Just a reminder that um, if you're taking public comment just on the amendment, then you're going to have to take public comment again on the motion. Oh, how well I know that. Okay, yes, all right. Absolutely. The first we want to see if the motions get amended, then we have to vote the whole motion with the new, with the new amendment. All those years of parliamentary training, it's such a pain in the neck. All right, so we're, we're, we're voting on taking the words is not out and put has been on, has been placed on. I think that's the, that, that's the language. All right, public comment. We had no public comment from in person. Uh, WebEx uh, people, uh, DC moderator, would you mind opening the microphones for public comment? Just this on the amendment, moderate. changing those words. This is the moderator, and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this amendment, uh, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? I would, thank you. All right, let us take a vote on the amendment. All right, Dr. You. Okay. Um, I was hoping to go now just to amend the motion. Okay. 
Okay, so let's take a roll. Chen? Chen, I. Chen, I. Cousin Phil? I. Scott? Captain? Lorraine? Lorraine, I. Lorraine, I. Mackenzie? Mackenzie, yes. Mackenzie, yes. Medina? Medina, I. Medina, I. Molina? Absent. Moro? Moro, I. Moro, I. Olagi? Olagi, yes. Olagi, yes. Pacheco? Pacheco, I. Pacheco, I. You, I. Okay, motion passed. Motion has passed it. Now, what we can do, I think, to keep it clear, and uh, Ms. Welsh, let me know. Motion B, we can say we will approve the proposed regulatory text as amended. Because we're going to, all of that data in that, that we just spit is going to go with this. And let it go with that. And then from there, we can then, the rest of it will go. Are we good? Welsh? I need to defer to Ms. Shields. She um, is All right. a stickler Ms. about making sure the minutes are very clean for OAL. Thank you. Ms. Shields, you still with us? Can you hear me now? I can, yes. Do you okay. Can, so you we hear usually what I say suggested? approved. We usually say approved as amended at this meeting. Uh, say that again, please. Approved as amended at this meeting. Okay. Uh, again, uh, you have the other. We're going to then say approve the proposed regulatory text approved as amended at this meeting, and then we'll go on to, uh, in addition, submit the text to so on and so forth. Yes, that, correct. Okay, just language. You want language changed. All right. Do you have Please. that? One has that. So approved as amended at this meeting is what that's going to say after the fact. I think Ms. Tarrant has it. All right. So now we are ready for motion B. All right. Uh, who wants to make that? You want to read? Just, just, just read it as and using the right words. Go ahead. Motion B. Go ahead, Dr. Morrow. <laughs> I, I think at this hour of the day we can go with that. Okay, and uh, Dr. Chan, you still want to second it. All right, so we now have a motion basically with the amended text in there to, to take care of that little dis, disconnection. Another, another comment, Ms. Welch? All right, so to be clear, the motion is to approve the proposed regulatory text for Section 1006 as amended at this meeting. That is correct. That's correct. Well, you didn't say it was. It was implied, but no. The, and as well, so you're good with that. Yes, that, I'm that. good with that. And it in also includes the rest of the paragraph. Yes, ma'am. On page 90 in motion B, I just wanted to make sure the wording in that first sentence is clear. It is to me, to all of us. All right, we're good. We're good. So now we have to. We're about to make a motion, a, a vote on that. Any in-person comment on that? Seeing no one getting up, we're going to go to. Uh, Public comments from individuals in the WebEx. Uh, DCA moderator, please facilitate the lines for public comment. This is the moderator and a direction of the board. I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A yeah. icon located at the yeah. bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? All right. I, think, I think we're ready to go. No public comment. Thank you. You can close that. Let us take the vote on this, and then we're going to take a quick 30-second uh, recess to straighten out something. Um, we're now voting. Dr. Yu, take the vote on motion B with the words as we put them in today. Yes, okay. Now you mentioned the motion already, so uh, now I call the roll. Okay. Chen? Chen, I. Felsenfeld. Felsenfeld, I. Ford, Epson. Lorraine. Mackenzie. Mackenzie, yes. Mackenzie, yes. Medina. Medina, I. Medina, I. Molina. Epson. Morrow. Morrow, I. Morrow, I. Olagi. Olagi, yes. Olagi, yes. Pacheco. Pacheco, I. Okay. Pacheco, I. U, I. Motion passed. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes the open session of today's meeting. Uh, we are going to recess for about five or six minutes to begin closed session. So those of you who don't belong here, thank you for being here and helping us today. And we will see you tomorrow if you come back.